So um, I use the extreme example, um, and I'll use Lux here as, as kind of my proxy. Um, uh, the extreme example of a, of a jungle or a canopy system. And you've got a little frog in the canopy, and you can measure, uh, say, 500 Lux right, in, a, in a little, in a little uh, bit of the jungle. But of course, the jungle isn't always dense, right? There are these patches of sunlight. There are these beams of sunlight going through. Mm -hmm. And if the frog has a choice always to move into those patches of sunlight all the time, and if we measure the lux in that area, we would get a much higher level of, of a much higher reading of lux. So, in, for example, 115,000 lux. And it's this that we want to do in an enclosure. And of course, lux, you can swap that out for UVI, you can swap that out for power density, you can swap that out for temperature if you really want. You'll always end up with a cooler area of, 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 of an environment and a warmer area of an environment. And usually that warmer area or that brighter area or that area with more UVI will be a patch of sunlight. To the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, I'm speaking with Thomas Griffiths, who is the owner of Tamascus, which is a animal husbandry and lighting consultant agency out of the UK. Now, Thomas really does focus most of his energy on proper lighting, so he helps keepers and reptile keepers and also zoos create and establish good lighting protocols for the animals that they keep not just reptiles but other animals as well but in this episode we really dive into the deep end of lighting in general i really tried to lay out or ask thomas to lay out a foundation of some of those terms that people use all the time so if you're somebody that just struggles to grasp lighting in this episode, we go through the light spectrum. We go through color temperature. You know, you see light bulbs with 2000 Kelvin, 6500 Kelvin. What does that mean? We talk about that. We talk about the solar spectrum, what light energy actually comes to the earth. How do we use bulbs in order to replicate that light spectrum? We talk about UVI. What is UVI? How is it measured? How, do the, how does the solar meter work? What does the solar meter do to read a, a UVI index or the UVI, I should say? He also talks about a study that him and Serena Vunderlich did uh, a few months back where they actually looked at different solar meters and I think essentially is the first long or multi-unit test of solar meters and to, to judge whether or not these are accurate devices and whether or not we should be using them at all. We discuss lux, lumens, par, you know, all these terms that constantly get thrown around that you might be just shaking your head. What do those mean? Well, we talk about it in this episode. I will say if you are listening on just audio platform only. I wish you luck, but I think this is one that you absolutely should have the visual element of YouTube for. So if you're listening to it, you already have it going in your car or in, on your workout, you can listen to it. You'll, you'll definitely pick up a lot of really good information. But because lighting is such a complex topic, it is very difficult to convey many of these messages with just the audio. So coming to the YouTube side, you will, Thomas has an amazing presentation that he puts together. There's a bunch of slides that have animations and whatnot that will really help your, your understanding. And we use them. We're talking about the images on the screen. So again, if you're listening to the audio, you can definitely listen to it. You'll pick up some things, but you're going to definitely want to come back to the YouTube side to see some of those vis visuals to fully understand these concepts. Again, lighting is just not one of those things that's easy to just verbally explain because it it is very, very complex. If you're looking for more information on this episode or any other episode, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. Thank you so much to Custom Reptile Habitats for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. For those who are watching on YouTube, you can see I have the last two enclosures that are set up and behind me. They're not, there's nothing in them yet. There's some plants in one, but they will be full and they'll have animals in them soon. And of course, I'll do a video on that on YouTube. So if you're not subscribed on YouTube, make sure you do there so you don't, or make sure you're subscribed there so you don't miss that video. Thank you so much to every single one of my Patreon members. I just am so grateful for everybody that supports me on that platform. So if you do want to help pr promote the show and produce the show by funding it through Patreon, you can do that at patreon.com slash animals at home. Now, let's jump into this episode. There's a ton of information here, so you may have to get through this one a couple of times to just absorb it all, but enjoy. Welcome to the GoFundMe for the Ball Python Deep Dive Project. 
This is an episodic docu-series. We want to include all the relevant studies on ball pythons and then weave that into the story, weave that into the journey of discovery for the viewer. But this isn't just a documentary, we're doing real science at the same time. So we're creating an international study on how ball pythons use their enclosures. And then finally, we want to analyze all the interpretations, all the footage of wild animals bring it all together, extract the data from studies, look at this holistic viewpoint and then identify the gaps and go out to Ghana ourselves and film those gaps. We want to go to Ghana with a team of professionals and film bull pythons in the wet season. Will there be so much flooding that bull pythons are forced to climb for refuge? Or will they just be moving in their environment? Let's find out. Either way, we'll show what we find. This is something of an order of magnitude that has never been done before. We want to set a new bar and put it right up here. So if you would like to help in any way to make this possible, then please check out the GoFundMe. Well, Thomas, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for being here. Hello. How are I think you? I'm doing great. I think we have a lot to cover today. And I think this will be one of those episodes where just it's going to be almost like an information dump. And people who are confused by lighting or who are just kind of on the peripheries of kind of understanding all the different terms that get thrown around. I'm hoping that this episode clears a lot of that up and then we'll get into some really interesting stuff about solar meters and how to use them and whatnot in a little bit. But mm -hmm. I'd like to give everybody a little bit of background in yourself. So, uh, you know, uh, how did you get into working with reptiles and keeping reptiles? And I kind of want to get into your education or how, how you fell into this lighting role as well. Sure. Um, it's a broad question. I mean, I'm, I'm 30 years old, so um, some people would call me a whippersnapper. Uh, to some people, I'm old. Um, I my first reptile was a garter snake when I was seven years old, right? And in the in the UK, they're quite we don't, you don't see them that often. Garter snakes in pet stores, anyway. Mm. Um, and seven year old me uh, decided to call him Tommy. I don't know why. Um, and he, you know, he moved out with us to when we moved house and things like that. Um, and of course, eventually he died. And that was kind of my first look into reptiles. But along with that, I also always kept like little jars with spiders in that I'd caught outside. And the, the pretty much the standard sort of thing, people catching animals and keeping them as a child. That's, yeah. I imagine that's what most people give the answer of. Um, but I think the main the main thing that really got me super I mean I was always more interested in animals than people right that's kind of always been my thing the, th the thing that really got me interested was we um went on a family trip to Kenya mm. and obviously you you go on safari you see all the animals but we went to a uh, like a rescue center and I can't for the life of me remember the name but but they had um apparently a famous story of this hippo and this tortoise that kind of became best friends um and it's an al i think it's an aldabra tortoise that kind of came over on a shipment and crash landed on the coast of kenya and was was rescued uh and the same with this hippo this baby hippo was rescued and they became like best friends and that really like it, it really blew my mind that the animals could have this sort of weird connection with each other mm -hmm. um and when we got home, I we bought a tortoise, a little Herman's tortoise. Um, and then it kind of spiraled a little bit from there. So within, you know, within 15 years, I've ended up with uh, buying a new house specifically for reptiles. So I've got, I moved into this house so that I could keep more animals. Um, and that that's kind of, <laughs> I've, I've got a few, I've got like the classic beta dragon. I've got a little ball python. Um, but I've got a tegu, I've got uh, some little scorpion tail geckos, mm -hmm. uh, and then I've been trusted with taking on some Egyptian tortoises, tested Oklai Mani, as part of the Studbook program, the European Studbook Foundation have, have been kind enough to give me some of those, um, with the hopes of breeding some, maybe, in the near future. And so, yeah, that's that's kind of how I got into reptile keeping and animal I have cats as well so animal animal keeping as a whole um and you asked about education so yeah so I, I, i'm curious did your is your edge because we, we will obviously get into lighting and you're kind of a lighting expert at this point is your education associated with the lighting world or are those two totally um, different things <laughs> so i i i trained in in tv and film production 
Okay. And I worked with like recording studios and things like this for quite a while. Um, but I was even in that whole world, I was always more interested in the the lighting side of it, right? So I worked on some uh, some game shows in the UK with like slow motion camera photography, and we had to work about we had to like consider like flicker frequencies because we're working in slow motion. Um, and using different lenses on lamps to create different effects. Um, so I was always really interested in the lights. And it never really dawned on me that the two things could be connected, animals and lights, until, again, until I got my tortoise. And I was on uh, a, a forum called Reptile Forums UK, RFUK. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on the little tortoise section. And I'd, I remember buying, I bought a, an Arcadia T8 tube. Um, and I remember saying... Uh, posting a little post on there saying something along the lines of um, I noticed there's a 10% and a 5%. Is there a way of testing these things? Is there a way of checking if these things, you know, do what they say they do? And I remember John Courtney Smith from Arcadia responded uh, a, a, a quite a simple response, just saying, yes, the 10% is stronger than 5%. Mm -hmm. um, and we test them. Um and it, it, he said something like, we get them tested by a specialist. And then it turns out that specialist was was Francis Baines. Right. Um, and I that led me down the route of checking out her really old website, UV Guide, um, downloading all of the stuff, highlighting it, scribbling all over it. Um, I remember once the website had like a black background and white text. I remember once accidentally printing a page and it just oh. so much black ink. So, um, so yeah, that was a thing. Um, and it, <laughs> And it uh, this all, is one of those things too, where you like you see it happening. And there's just like a car accident. Well, there's, yeah, there's nothing I can do. It's like and oh, just there watching it. Goes. it. Uh, luckily, <laughs> I mean, luckily, I was young, right? It's like 15 years ago, or whatever. Now, 13 years ago. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> my mum and dad's money. I didn't. I didn't That's care. right. Um, <laughs> and um, yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of how it happened. I uh, I, I don't have any sort of biology degree. I don't have any degree. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of that, there's no formal education, really. Um, a lot of it was self-taught just from reading papers and reading uh, the work of other people. Um, and, and yeah, that's how I ended up doing that. I mean, I, I remember not long ago, the, the dawn of the first sort of UVB LED products coming out. And I remember um, joining the Reptile Lighting Facebook group. Um, and within a few months, I was asked to become a member of the admin team um and yeah and then now that's kind of what i do and now i've I've kind of launched my own little brand where i act as a research and development consultant for lamp manufacturers so i get a lot of lamps sent to be for testing uh, but also i go to zoos or private keepers or farms and help them with their lighting so i we, last week we were in switzerland doing some reptile lighting and some uh, primate lighting testing out some some lamps that are kind of new in the market um so yeah that's kind of that's kind yeah, of what so I, you're, how I ended up your lighting expertise is really built on a practical experience and just kind of diving in head first to literature and working on you know new products and testing things for yourself and and just kind of yeah getting it's the crash almost like an way. obsession so it's like a um almost like a like an obsession like i say so it's it's like a you know, I mean, it's 30 years of sort of undiagnosed autism is essentially what it is. It's kind of yeah. printing things off and, and, and really learning everything I can about it and, and you know, going to the library back in the day and reading things like that. So it's it's a lot of it is essentially just obsession. So let's talk a little bit about the the business you've built. I don't know if that's your full-time thing now, but you, you kind of mentioned it. Maybe you could tell us the name and yeah, you, you'd mentioned going to the zoos and whatnot, but but maybe give us an example, like when you were in Switzerland, what, what, what were you up to? So the the brand is Tamascus. Um, it's it's called that because um, as a child, my dad, for some reason, used to just call me Tamascus. I think it kind of sounds like Damascus, the place, and I don't I don't know if, but Tamascus. I mean, it's always been my like online username. I used it when I was you know like Xbox Live and all mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Like Tamascus was always my name, so I've just stuck with it. Um, and yeah, in, so in Switzerland, uh, we went. They have these these huge huge um metal halide lamps which are um we could touch on what they are later on specifically but um they're essentially a, a, a kind of lamp that emits uvb uva visible light um and they're pretty 
well used in a lot of European zoos, um, but not well, not well, not at all used in the UK. And I'm working with some zoos in the UK on lighting animals uh, such as giraffes and elephants. Um, I worked. Um, I worked on uh, as a bit of a consultant on the Biasa, uh giraffe light light giraffe guidelines uh, in the lighting area. Um, and at the moment, we can't give any definitive sort of guidelines for lighting large animals like that because the lamps don't exist, mm. uh, or at least in the UK market. Um, I've approached the manufacturer of these lamps. There's a few different manufacturers of them. Um, and they all obviously say very good things, but I wanted to know more than just those good things. Right? I wanted to know the, the gritty of it, like how often do we have to change the bulbs? And the manufacturer could say one thing, but it's one thing I've learned is that it's not always necessarily the truth. So um, the zoos got us in to come and A, test to make sure they weren't emitting UVC, anything like that, independent of the manufacturer's claims. Uh, but also it gave me an opportunity to ask them about what they find about the lamps. Are they working as, you know, are they lasting a long time or things like this? Um, and that was really good. I met, um, it was in uh, in Bern in Switzerland, a uh, beautiful city. Uh, they have this this river that goes through the city and people jump in it and go for a little swim. And it's, it's it, it, the thing that it's the capital city and the equivalent capital city in London is, in England is, the, is London. It has the Thames and nobody swims in that. But in yeah. Bern, everybody swims in this river, so it's it's really fun to see this difference. Um, but yeah, they they have the Tier Park Zoo, um, and I met the curator there, and we we tested some lights, pretty much. And, and what kind of equipment do you have? Have you had to acquire over the years? Is it, I'm obviously solar meters and whatnot, but is there any other sort of investments that you've had to make in that department? Yes, I'm 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 very very lucky that um, my family has has worked very hard. My family has come from. You know, not a lot of money, and they're they they're comfortable. Um, and being a part of that means that I have I have some shares in the family business. Um, so I, I I at the time at the time had a little bit of money, um, and I was able to to um to buy a uh, what's called a spectrometer, mm-hmm. which is essentially a device that reads light and. Uh, it collects data from light. It means we can analyze that data. Um, it means we can do much more than than say a, uh, a solar meter could, or much more than than a thermometer gun could ever do. Um, and with that came the ability to kind of rent out my services of using the spectrometer. I mean, you know, they're 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 not the cheapest things in the world, and it also takes a little bit of time to learn how to use it and to. Not only learn how to use it, but learn how to read the data that comes from it. Right. Um, to be able to look at it on the screen and instantly know what the information means. Um, a lot of it is just code. So it almost looks like you're reading the matrix. Um, you, you just look at it and know what you're picking up on. Um, so yeah, essentially that's that's what the companies are paying for, is they're paying for the access to the spectrometer, but also the kind of the expertise of being able to be able to read the spectrometer and do things with it. Yeah, yeah, that makes um, sense. So yeah, that's that's kind of what I do. And I, not only that, I go around and I take thermal images and I'll give them advice on how to light their animals and things like that. That's that's yeah. kind of what I have. I have a, a plethora of things. I have a little briefcase of, of goodies that I carry around with me. Yeah, that's amazing. And and I think as we'll learn shortly, the un, being able to view the spectrum that's being produced by the bulb is so crucial. It, it Really, everything else kind of gives you just like tertiary information. It doesn't give you enough to go, okay, what is coming off this bulb? You can be tricked by a whole bunch of other things like color of the light, the UV meter, all these different things. And the spectrum, the spectrometer will give you what it is and sort of answers questions. Yeah, I mean, it'll give you it'll, um, it'll give you a, a, a good portion of it. I mean, in terms of if we're thinking the solar spectrum, for example, um, my spectrometer will read about 50% of it. It reads the shortest of the wavelengths. Um, much of the infrared is you need a, a, a very expensive piece of equipment to read that bit. Uh, I guess look, for like our surfaces, like John. it's probably okay that you're not getting into too far into the infrared, right? I mean, you, you, we are like I don't know, like I mean, I guess beyond infrared, you start getting into dangerous wavelengths as well when you get into like microwaves and. Um, I mean, yeah, they're they're non-ionizing, so it's kind of. Um, I mean, technically speaking, we're all covered in microwaves anyway, right? There's there's microwaves everywhere, there's radio waves everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but yeah, we'll we'll touch on later so why we don't necessarily need to read that part of the spectrum anyway. Um, it's partly because we pretty much know what's going on because right. of basic physics. Um, so we can almost guesstimate that part of the spectrum based on our understanding of of how lamps work. Sure. Um, yeah, that makes so sense. it's it's. It, I mean, it'd be really fun to see that part of the spectrum. Um, but if so we had to choose like, between the two sides, we're going to go. Yeah, with the I'd absolutely. Lines. You know, we, we the, the the shorter the wavelength, the more energized the the light is, um, and thus potentially the more dangerous it is. So as you get the, as you get down to the shorter wavelengths, you end up in the UVC and things like that, which are which are you know deadly. Exactly. Well, why don't we get into some of these terms that everybody on the lighting page gets thrown around, and we use it on the podcast all the time. And for mm-hmm. those people who are just like ah. I don't know enough to feel like I'm hanging on to this conversation. I think it would be good to kind of lay a foundation for people. So maybe yeah. did, did you want to share your screen and we can start with that? Like, I'm, I'm, yeah, we I'm, can we can do that. I think it's worth you know. I've, so I've been asked um, again another great honor. Um, uh, have you dealt with reptophiles at all? Yes, Mariah. Yeah, she's good yeah, Mariah. Yeah. So Mariah, you know, another great honor. She asked me to kind of write a, a guest blog post um, on the reptophiles blog. And something that that blog post is about, I don't know when that is out actually, but either way, when uh, that blog post is about kind of how we relay information to new keepers mm-hmm. and whether we should use technical language or not. And it's kind of like a, a, a discussion with myself about what and why. And yeah, one of the big things I see a lot on uh, the, a lot of the Facebook groups and things like that is, is, um, like people saying that we shouldn't use technical language because they're a beginner and they, you know, if somebody's a beginner, they won't, they won't know. I'm kind of on the fence about that as to whether we should kind of just teach them the technical language and then maybe they will know. Yeah. Uh, Cause it's not a lot beginner. of, it's actually less confusing than you might think, right? I mean, you can yeah, really get into the Yeah, as long as you have the, the base understanding, you can, it, it's really easy to, to kind of, I say it's really easy. You, you do sometimes need about eight degrees to understand some of it, but uh, yeah, I can show. I can share my screen. Show we'll 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 go from there, shall we? Yeah, and the, and the, so for anyone listening on the audio platform, I'll make sure everything's time stamped on the YouTube video. You will be able to follow along a lot with the audio because a lot of this will be verbal explanation. But there also Thomas has some amazing uh, images in here, so you might want to double back to YouTube to take a look. But yeah, let let's start with uh, whatever you want to start with, Thomas. So, sure. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I, reiterate that fact that some of it is quite visual um if anyone's listening they may just hear me say the words this and that and there whereas on the screen it, um, i've got our always pointing at things so i do apologize for anyone listening um i hope dylan you'll remind me to uh, like describe what i'm what i'm showing on the screen uh so so that anyone listening can uh, can can hear it yeah yeah um, we'll do i um i always start my any any sort of presentation i do with uh the statements i'm going to lie to you uh, and usually a little link to a, a youtube video from a channel called kurzgesagt um which is a german channel um they do videos in english you know all sorts of languages um and it, it, it it's a really good video i think it's like 12 minutes long and it kind of condenses down the idea of how and why it's okay to lie when educating people um, they use the example of lying to children. Uh, so w- w- a really good example is when you're in school and you learn about enzymes in the body, um, in the stomach, and you learn that it's almost like a Pac-Man and a, and, a, and a ball and they fit together perfectly. And actually enzymes don't look anything like that. Of course they don't. But what you're doing is you're teaching a child a fundamental uh, kind of piece of knowledge that they can put nuance on top of and, and expand that knowledge later on. So that's what I'm going to do right now is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a brief overview of things on the hope that people can then look further into that themselves and learn a bit more themselves. Uh, so n- not necessarily everything I'm saying is 100% true, necessarily. Uh, I've There is also some caveats at the bottom of the screen, um, if and when I've, when I've presumed they are needed. So sure. yeah, I, mean, I can go through it if you want. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah, I, th- I think it's important to know. Yeah, it's, it's not even really lying. It's more just like, you know, that's how you give the information. Another example of I can course, think of yeah, is... I think the, 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 the idea of the word lying is... It, the, the, it has the a term, negative connotation, yeah. Yeah, of course, lying sounds really bad, but it's um it's a premise called lying to children. That's what the premise is called. So, yeah, yeah. Um, 
an- another example I can think of with like adults when you're dealing with firearm safety, the bit, the first rule of firearm safety is you always assume the gun is loaded. And mm-hmm. even though you might have been the last person to operate that firearm, you but you still pick up the firearm and you check it as if it was loaded. And mm-hmm. in some ways it's a lie, but you have that's a rule that you must follow yes. uh, to, to stay safe and that, you know, you know, it's easily provable to, to be a lie every time. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's how you spoon feed the information to make again, sure things are yeah. done well. And, and and the word lie sounds bad in that situation, but it's not. It's it is a lie, right? It's um and that yeah. So I mean, whenever I've given a presentation or showed a presentation to people, people often critique when I say this. They'll say, "Oh, don't apologize up front. I always apologize at the end." But I, you know, I disclaimer: not everything I'm showing or saying is a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, take it with a heap of salt, really. Okay. So, let's, um, let's dive in. Yeah, please. So, um, when what I did is I asked some friends, right? What do you what do you know about light? What is light? And they said, I don't know. I've heard the word wavelength and the word photon. Um, I've heard speed of light. So I thought, right, okay, let's let's scroll right back and start from the very top, right? And what is light in its most basic form? Um, and in its most basic form, light consists of particles, inverted commas, that are called photons. And a photon is just a packet of energy. That's all light is, it's energy. Uh, And a photon is the smallest piece of light. If you imagine uh, light as being a bucket of sand, one grain of sand is a photon. It's the smallest piece that there is. Um, And the the technical word for that is quantum. That's what quantum means. It means small. Mm. Um, And light as uh, as a thing, has different mechanisms of actions. So sometimes it acts like a particle, sometimes it acts like a wave. And these are called the mechanics, right? And thus quantum mechanics. That's what quantum mechanics is. It just means small things act differently. And that officially makes you a scientist, Dylan. You're now a scientist, Rock. <laughs> yes. Um, so I've got a little visual thing on the screen. Um, and it's it kind of shows a photon. That's the black dot. And you can see that there is uh, the green kind of line, wiggly line, and the blue wiggly line. And that is a photon uh, interacting with both of the electromagnetic fields. And if I pause the animation, you can see that the electromagnetic fields both have a wave-like structure to them. And we can measure this 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 uh, this wave, and we call it the wavelength. And that's what wavelength is. Wavelength is just the amount of interaction that a photon has on the electromagnetic fields. That's all that is. And we measure it in nanometers. So if you imagine meter or kilometer, meter, centimeter, micrometer, nanometer is this really, really small scale. Um, and that's how that's how we we define wavelength. Um, and you can you can sort of split the, the light up into its wavelengths. Um, so you've probably seen the Pink Floyd uh, album cover looks looks something like this. It's kind of a piece of light going into a prism. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, I can pause the animation. And you can see that white light is coming in from the left, and it's being split up by the prism into its into its separate wavelengths. And you can see that red is one of the colors, and that has a wavelength, you know, X. And violet on the other end of the uh, the rainbow has a different wavelength, and those two are different to each other, right? They have different wavelengths. And thus, violet has a shorter wavelength, and red has a longer wavelength. And that's all that means is that it just means that it's it splits up and it's got it's reacts on the electromagnetic fields differently to each other. Mm. Um, And of course, you can go longer than red, of course, and we get infrared. That's what infrared is. It's the longer than red wavelengths. And we can do the other way. We can go shorter than violet, and we end up with ultraviolet. That's what that means. Um, And of course, we can plot that on on, in scale. So we can get all of the colors, and we can put them in order. And we have ultraviolet, and then the colors are in both violet, indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, red, infrared. And that's just them in order of, of of the wavelengths in order. Does that make sense? Is that <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I, I did wonder if that would make perfect sense. Um, and we can plot this on a graph, right? And most people will, if presented, if they're on a forum or a Facebook group, they they may be presented with a spectral graph. And this is how we present most of the time. This is how we present uh, spectral data. Right? It's visual, and it makes it makes sense if you know how to read it. So I can I can kind of show you how to read it. Please. Um, we can plot these these different wavelengths on a graph, and you can see the wavelength numbers are across the bottom, and again they're measured in nanometers. And across the y-axis, we have 
the for the sake of this you can call it the intensity right it's um, most of the time it's the uh, absolute spectral irradiance you don't need to consider that just consider it the intensity right providing that the the spectral graph is a calibrated graph from a calibrated meter you can just consider this the intensity mm. so for example a a bar like this would appear on a graph and this would be a spectral graph and you could say that this is a bar that is around 500 nanometers on the graph at the bottom and it has an intensity of 130 whatever that is and that's how you read a graph right i, I saw recently on one of the groups uh someone you know said they were a bit ashamed but they didn't know how to read a graph and you know the first thing don't be ashamed if you don't know how to read a graph that's it's actually quite an it you know it's it, you need to know two-dimensional maths and it, we can show we can show relatively easy how to read a graph and that's essentially how you read a graph is you look at the x-axis and the y-axis and that gives you a, a plot uh, and we can actually uh, label these different parts of the graph with names and that's what we've done we've we label parts of the spectrum part different wavelengths with different names so we label anything in this area of this graph uh, uvc and unnatural uvb so anything that is in there that's what that's called if something's here it's called natural uvb if something's here it's called uva one or two if something's here it's visible light infrared a infrared b infrared c you get the idea yeah and just by and, natural versus unnatural is just strictly what we get here on Earth from the sun. Yeah, I'll, what I'll do is I'll zoom in on that section and I'll kind of show how we get it. Okay, okay, um, perfect. And this is, so this is kind of a labeled version of this specific graph. Obviously, every graph will have a slightly different scale to it. So maybe one graph you look at doesn't have the infrared in, involved. Um, but this is how I would read this graph. And I can put sunlight on that. So I can show you a graph of what sunlight looks like. And this is what's called the ASTM standard sunlight. And it looks like this. And you can see that there is a tiny amount of natural UVB. You can see that down here. Yeah. You see my mouse? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's a significant amount of UVA, one and two. There's a whole heap of visible light. And then we have infrared A, infrared B, and there's you know essentially no infrared C. And that is the graph. I can I can take away the label so you can see it a bit more clearly. Um, and what the software does is the software colors it in quite nicely as well. So you can see how each wavelength corresponds to the equivalent color. Uh, that's just something the software does. I think it's quite nice. Um, so you mentioned, excuse me. Uh, so you mentioned the idea of uh, UVI and uh, things like you mentioned, that's what you wanted to talk about when we, when we agreed to do this. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. So we can we can look at what that means, and we can look at what UVB is, and things like that. So we can we can zoom in on the spectrum. Where was I? So what we can do is we can actually look at how the su the sun looks on a spectrum, right? And that's what this is. Um, it's worth noting that there are these sort of weird dips in the spectrum that you can see. So you can see mm -hmm. there's a dip at around one thousand four hundred nanometers on the map. Um, what that is is they're called Fraunhofer lines. That's a, a, a fancy term. Um, the sun itself actually emits a much more smooth uh, graph, and it looks more like this. But what happens is as the sunlight passes through the atmosphere, parts of it are removed, and that's where you end up with these sort of lines. Like um, I'll touch on that sort of smooth uh, rate, the, the, the smooth graph later on when we talk about uh, heat lamps. But just know that that is a, this is what we get on the on the, the surface of the earth it's not necessarily what the sun actually emits right but so the, the, the atmosphere does act as a bit of a filter for these specific bars of, of of light absolutely yeah so the when the light passes through uh water vapor in the air things like that um it, it, those those our particles in the air will remove part of the spectrum um, which is a good like, thing <laughs> yeah almost, if you if you imagine the simplest way of imagining it is a cloud right you can see a cloud and the reason you can see it is because it's blocking some of the light. Yeah. Um, it does the, you know, it's the same thing. So the light that isn't blocked looks more like this. So on more Earth, like a parabola. Yeah. Yeah. On Earth, we get, you know, a, a, a sort of chopped part of it. Now, of course, this is an average. Um, and this would be, you know, during daytime. At nighttime, it's different. In the morning, it's different. Uh, in the hottest parts of the world, on the hottest days, it's different as well. Mm -hmm. But this is an average sort of spectrum. If you saw this, you would say that is the solar spectrum. 
Um, so we can talk about uh, UVI. You mentioned UVI when we agreed to uh, have this chat. Um, and UVI is in relation to um, this part of the spectrum here, the sort of the shortest end of the spectrum. The UV side, yeah. The ultraviolet side, correct, yeah. Um, so we can zoom in on that, and I've zoomed in on that here. Um, so just to reorient ourselves, we've got the intensity across the left-hand side, and you can see the numbers are a bit different on this graph. And the wavelengths are across the bottom again. But again, these numbers are different. So I've zoomed in on the on the spectrum. So this graph is different to the previous one. Uh, and I can label it again so we can put ourselves back into orientation of where we are. So for the sake of this, anything here is classed as UVC. So anything That's between it. sort of 200 and 280 nanometers. Yeah, 200 and even further down than 200. Um, but up to, up to around 280 nanometers is UVC. Uh, anything from 280 to 290 is unnatural UVB. This means that technically speaking it is uvb um if we ask a physicist to define uvb they would include this but this doesn't exist in sunlight at least naturally and should that be treated basically as if it were a uvc you yeah think? for all intents and purposes in, in animal keeping yes absolutely okay uh, this part of the spectrum is again it's unnatural so the body and animals haven't evolved a defense against it gotcha the same way we have against uv you know the natural part of uvb um, there is another part of the spectrum which I've kind of made up the name of, and I call it rare UVB. Um, and the reason I call it this is because technically it's natural, but there is so it's so rarely seen that it's essentially the same. It's essentially unnatural, right? You see it in the hottest parts of the Australian desert. You see it in uh, the Galapagos Islands on you know in summertime on the hottest three days of the year, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you, and it's so. Tiny, you get such tiny amounts of it that it's essentially non-existent, but it does technically exist in nature. Right. Um, so some people would class it as natural, you know, natural UVB, but I call it rare UVB. Again, that's not an agreed technical term. That's just me. Um, and that's from about 290 to about 295 nanometers. Okay. Uh, then from 295 to 320-ish nanometers. Uh, we have what we call the natural or the terrestrial UVB. So this is the stuff that if you go outside in the sun, you will be exposed to this. Uh, then we have UVA2 and UVA1. I've They're generally called UVA as a, a standard. I split them up, and many people do now split them up, um, because UVA2 is more generally related to vitamin D, and UVA1 is generally related to reptile vision or animal vision. Okay. So they they are different. They're UVA together, but actually they have very different biological functions. So I split them up um, nowadays um, for most most circumstances. I'll split them up. And again, I can put on the solar spectrum so you can see what it actually looks like. Uh, again, this is a zoomed in version, and there it is. This is the ASTM solar reference spectrum again. Um, and I'll, I'll take away the things you can see what that looks like. Um, and for those listening that, who have listened to the podcast about lighting before might remember that the UVA, and now we're calling UVA2 section that has to do with U, uh, D3 synthesis was the basically the shutoff valve for mm -hmm. the D3 production. So because people might think, oh, I thought UVB was for D3 synthesis. Yes, it is. But there's the other side of UVA that we need to turn off the, the production of D3. Uh, yeah, well, it's, yeah. Um, some people use uh, the brakes. Some people use shut off. I, I use regulate. regulate I think okay. regulate um, kind of makes it sound more like it's controlled. Um, it, it regulates the, the synthesis of vitamin D3. So that's what UVA2 does, yeah. Um, so and it's vital. a really vital, vital part of the spectrum. Uh, it, it's vital for that part. And you can see here that if um, if we look at it, the sun, essentially on, on the screen now, what we're seeing is, you know, most of the screen is actually covered with empty space, right? Most of it on this UV part isn't even, there's no sunlight there. So what I what I tend to do is I tend to kind of zoom in a bit more to get rid of that dead space. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can put the labels back on so you can see them there. So uh, again, we've got UVC all the way up to UVA1. And it's interesting to see uh, the, the volume of, UV, of UVB, how, how low the volume is compared to UVA. Yeah, it's so just a little UVB blip on the UVB makes up less than 0.5% of sunlight. Wow, that's amazing. It's it's such a tiny bit, but it's really important, right? It's really important for biological processes. And on the screen, I've put some what we call the action spectra. Don't expect anyone to know what that is, um, but I'm showing that there are numerous uh, 
parts of the parts of the spectrum that are associated with important key biological functions. And in fact, these ones are the ones associated with the vitamin D3 synthesis and regulation. Um, but for the for 99 percent of people, you don't need to know anything about that. That's just a, a visual aid to kind of show, look, this part of the spectrum, it's only a tiny amount, but it does so much. There's so many things involved in this part of the spectrum. And that's because it's the most energized part of the spectrum, the natural right. spectrum, right? And it's free energy. You get it from the sun. So it makes perfect sense that animals have evolved to use that free energy if it's there. Exactly. And it's perfect, you know, an evolutionary sense, right? And then uh, when you look thing, at a graph like this with the, with the um, uh, I, I, what did you call those lines again? The, well, these are the action spectra. Action, different, yeah, the, right, 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 the action animals. spectrum. So it, it looks like if you were to expose skin tissue to like UVC, you would have a D3 production on steroids. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. So technically speaking, UVC does help produce, uh, does help synthesize vitamin D. Yeah, it does. It just um, gives you the cancer at the same time. Yeah, oh yeah, it gives all that because we've not evolved the the safety mechanisms exactly, that are yeah. involved in pr protecting the skin against those things. So, yeah, they, they um, it will absolutely it will absolutely produce vitamin D. In fact, some of the psoriasis treatment plants, uh, lamps, not plants, <laughs> lamps, um, involve UVC to help treat psoriasis and kill cells, but also to help produce vitamin D three, which is associated with with helping psoriasis as well. Interesting. Uh, and the idea of those is you get exposed for twenty seconds, right? You get exposed for tiny amounts of time, but even that will will damage the skin absolutely, uh, and your eyes and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the the thing that most people uh, think about when they think about UV, or they should think about anyway, is the UVI. And UVI is a by definition. Uh, from the World Health Organization, UVI was created for human use, not for animal use. And it was created to determine in a mathematical formula the amount of energy or time it takes to get white human skin to go red in the sun. And that's what it means. And the, the, the technical word for that is erythema. Um, and you can see the official definition of UVI is here on the screen. So you can see it's a sharp uh kind of straight line in you know really high levels of of erythema of redness and then as the sun becomes more uh intense the actual the erythema drops down and that's because we have a natural defense against it mm -hmm. um that's the official definition of UVI. and the, the the mathematical form there is at the bottom of the screen if anyone's really interested in it um and most people will recognize uvi because they'll deal with it with their reptiles or their animals uh, or even if they go out in the sun, uh, in some of the warmer parts of the world, you might recognize, you know, you put the sun cream on, and that's to protect against this. Mm -hmm. um, we have a device that measures this, um, or at least something like this, and it's people will you recognize it as the solar meter, right? The solar meter 6.5. Um, and I can actually show the, um, the response for the solar meter 6.5. It looks like this. So it's not exactly the same as UVI, but it's very close. Um, and this means that we can use it as a proxy for, uh, for for measuring UVI. And actually, very closely related to that is the vitamin D spectrum. So we can actually use it as a proxy for both. So that blue line uh, is just telling us what the solar meter is capable of, of reading. Yes. So the solar meter is responsive to these wavelengths in, uh, in sensitivity of this scale, of this graph. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, for example, it is really sensitive to around 295 nanometers. You can see the, the graph is at its highest at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, so th this is the solar meter, right? Sorry, I'm just having a drink. And you can see that the solar meter does react from all the way in the shortest wavelengths to around 320 nanometers. It actually goes a little bit further than that as well. Um, but you can also see that, as I said, you can see that around 290 to 295 nanometers is where the meter is most sensitive. And it makes sense because this is the part that technically can exist in nature and thus has the most chance of causing erythema to the skin. Right. So it would make sense that the meter is most reactive to that part. Um, again, this wasn't designed for using with, with reptiles. It's, it's, it works well with reptiles for sun-like spectra but it you know it's designed for measuring the the uvi which is to do with skin reddening 
Uh, what it also means, as you pointed out, is that the it, it's reactive to UVC as well. Um, uh, you know, around 50% reactive. So it's pretty reactive to UVC. So a, a light source that emits UVC would give a reading on the solar meter 6.5. Right, and it's not going to tell you that it's UVC. It's just going to give you a UVI reading. Right. Yeah, correct, yeah. So it's designed for this spectrum here. It's designed for the solar spectrum, right? Or a spectrum that is like the solar spectrum. Right. So the best kind of quality T5s, your Arcadias, your Zoomeds, uh, those have a spectrum that is very similar, at least in the responsive range for solar meter uh, to the sun. So it, for 99.999% of people, uh, the solar meter 6.5 is, is a, a great device for measuring UVI. And I'll talk about it a little bit more later on because me and uh, Dr. Serena Wunderlich, who you may have you may know about, does mm -hmm. did a kind of a little study on on the meters um, at a conference recently, and I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so that's what UVI is, right? We've we've kind of discussed UVI. Um, the other big thing that people talk about is lux, or at least that's what I talk about. I try and talk about lux where I can. Um, and lux is to do with the the visual visible part of the spectrum, right? So the colors. And it's th this part here that I've highlighted. So for anyone watching, it's around 400 nanometers to around 800 nanometers. Again, these definitions are quite uh, blurry because some people can see slightly beyond other people in, in colors. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here it is. No expense spared on the animation there. Um, <laughs> there's my uh, there's my colors. And there's the uh, the solar spectrum in, in the visible range. And again, I, I won't label all the different things, but you can see how it's the same spectrum, but just zoomed in. Yeah, um, and lux, like I say, is 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 another mathematical formula. It's really simple mathematical formula, and it looks like this, which is uh, defined um, by what's called the CIE, which is a French, um, or the name is French. It's the International Color People, um, and it's it's peaks in the green wavelengths. Lux, um, and this is because lux is supposed to be a measure of uh, perceived brightness, again, inverted commas, perceived brightness um, for human vision. Right. And human vision peaks in sensitivity to color and to light as a whole in the green area. Um, and looks does have another definition, and the actual definition is looks one looks equals one lumen per square meter. And then, of course, you start then saying, well, bloody hell, now what's a lumen, right? Then we have to learn something <laughs> yeah. else. Um, and, and it's actually really, really simple, right? You can actually convert them really easily. Uh, again, there's a little animation on screen of a light bulb, and you might often see on the side, especially with LEDs, you'll see on the side of the box it says, you know, this emits 3,000 lumens or whatever. So this light bulb on the screen emits eight, I think there are eight lumens. And if we measure looks at, say, 10 centimeters away, we get three of those lumens in one meter squared. We can measure three lumens worth of of, of energy in uh, in one meter squared. Thus, we have three lux. And if we move further away, we're only measuring one lumen per meter squared, and thus we've only got one lux. Thus, as you move further away from a lamp, the lux value goes down. The lumens are always the same. It's always emitting eight lumens. Right. But the lux value goes away as you as you get further away. So lumens is what's coming off the bulb. The amount of photons, for example, coming off the bulb. Lux yeah. is the brightness of the surface of the where the light is hitting. Yeah. Correct, yeah. So, so yeah, you, exactly that. <laughs> um, but spectrum is really important because, again, it reacts like this, like it, with a peak, with a, with a like a bell curve and a, and a peak in around 550 nanometers. So you can see that it's actually not very reactive to blue light and it's not very reactive to red light. A lux, this is, if you use the lux meter, a little device to measure lux, Right. Uh, you would you would need a heck of a lot more red light to get the same reading of lux. Right, um, which makes sense because you know if, for our eyes, red light doesn't. You can't make something that bright with red light. It can still. Be the, and the reason is because our sensitivity is in the green light. Yeah, correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and and of course, lux is again. It's designed for the solar spectrum, similar to how UVI was originally designed for the solar spectrum. Lux is designed for the solar spectrum. So if we have this much green light we will have this much red light and this much blue light. Right. So you, it, the, the sensitivity, the curve can go down. Um, and it's actually coincidentally the real, not coincidentally, it's by design. Well, and I, I just want to quickly, I, I think I think what I understand you said there, but I want to make sure that everybody follows that. The, the reason that we can use that 
the, the lux meter to peak in the green light because we are, you know, it was designed to come off the sun. So we're not dealing with a bulb that might only be producing a strange amount of, uh, that would have a different spectrum than the sun. We can, yes, as, we can kind of use it as a proxy. If we have this much green light, then we can assume that this much red light is coming off the sun, but we yes. can't necessarily do that with a bulb. Correct. Yeah. And in fact, this is the reason that LEDs are bright, or one of the reasons that LEDs are bright, because the LED spectrum looks like that. Um, again, this isn't to scale, so there's no scale here. I'm just using it as a comparison. But you can see that the the vast majority of the light uh, is is in a curve that is very similar to the Lux curve. Yeah, so the green and the, the green area, and it, it tapers off at the same distance. Now, the way a LED actually works is that um, due to basic, you know, the, Electronics is the, the it's driven by a blue diode, and then on top of the blue diode is a like a phosphor coating that glows this other color. So what you get is a spike in the blue, and then this glow of other color, and that glow has been refined to match the looks, and that's why LEDs look really bright to humans. Yes, and that's yeah. why they give a really high look value. Because... And anybody at home can turn off their LED and then look at the the diodes, and you'll see those little yellow squares. Yeah, those yeah, are the little phosphorus yellow. Coating. I've got one here. This is a prototype, a really good prototype, actually. Um, and these use some really good uh, white diodes, but we call them white diodes, and it's like a little, um, well, yeah, almost like a yellow color, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what they are. Is they're the, they're the white, um, and yeah, people will have probably seen those. And that's yeah. So that's what Lux is. Uh, Lux is to do with uh, it's spectrum specific and it's human specific, but it's essentially a proxy for brightness. Right. Um, in sunlight, again, as always. So, something that um, we're bringing up a lot more now is infrared. And of course, I can't talk about this without mentioning uh, Ron Murin, who you've spoken to before. Yeah. Um, who is an absolute pioneer and um, a gentleman and on this front, he's he's kind of uh, the king of this. So I'll I'll try to touch on it without slaughtering his baby, <laughs> and without and you know I'll I'll also push on any correspondence straight to him as well. So if you have any questions, sorry, Ron. Uh, so infrared is 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 the longer part of the wavelengths, right? The, of the solar the solar spectrum. So eight hundred nanometers all the way up to about a millimeter, actually. So the wavelength is is you know, big. Um, but the bit we focus on the most, at least with ROM's work, is this part here. And we call this the infrared A part of the spectrum. And the reason we focus on this part is because this um, has significant biological functions. It plays a part in uh, neuroendocrine, uh, neuroendocrine control, plays a part in uh, upregulating genes in the body. Um, it also plays a part in, in the healing of uh, of tissue when it's when it's injured. In fact, I was at a zoo recently. I don't know if I should name them. Um, I was at a zoo recently, and I had a cut on my finger. Um, and the vet, one of the vet, one of the veterinary uh, specialists, uh, said, "Oh, we have a laser that's good for healing wounds." And I said, "Oh, okay." And I said, "Come and have a go." So classic. Put my hand under this laser, and we lasered my finger. Um, cool. Yeah, mm. don't know. Again, I won't name the zoo. Um, and we, we laser it and it's it's totally healed. There's a little bit of pinkness still in it, but it's it's healed. Um and it didn't hurt at all. And I, I said, This is insane. What the hell is this laser thing you're pointing at me and shooting me with? And we looked through all the paperwork and we flipped through the, the handbook and we looked. Um and the, the laser emits 600 nanometers to 1,300 nanometers, mm. which is literally this part of the spectrum. Yeah, infrared A. Um, infrared A, yeah, essentially infrared A, right? And that's what this laser emits. And there's a reason they use it medically to help heal wounds, and it's because it does that job. And, and so that would be uh, that would be an LED, right? It's an LED light that's shooting the laser, or, or um, that's creating. Yeah, the... it's 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 a laser diode. Yeah, yeah, I imagine it might even be two or three laser diodes in a, yeah. in a small space. But um, yeah, so laser diodes. Uh, see. The, the reason I think it's two or three is because that's a wide spectrum for a laser, right? Lasers right. usually have a, a very narrow band. So I'm I'm inclined, I, I didn't take it apart, but I'm inclined to think it's maybe three, four, five, even little diodes in one piece. Yeah. But essentially, yeah, it's, a, it's essentially it's a, a light emitting diode, yeah, an LED. Mm, that's cool. Um, with a very intense output. Uh, and it, obviously it had to, it was, it was right on my skin. The irony was that I said to the vet, you know what, um, 
how often do you use this? And so we use it all the time for, you know, if two animals will have a little fight, they'll have a little scrap and one will scratch the other and they'll they'll knock it down, they'll put it put it to sleep, bring it in, laser it, and then put it back. And I, I said, why don't you just put a heat lamp in the enclosure? <laughs> and you yeah, yeah. to provide this part of the spectrum for you don't need to stress the animal out putting it to sleep and bringing it in and paying a vet to come in and exactly it's yeah it's insane um so we looked at the the green curve that i showed you earlier that i said the sun actually emits yeah and we call that a, a a black body curve now in its simplest form a black body is a, a theoretical thing that absorbs all wavelengths equally um, but for, for, for most things that we can deal with, we just say that things are like a black body or act like a black body. Um, and a black body, when it gets enough energy, starts to re-emit energy, right? So when it gets enough, when, in, in, in doing so, it gets hot. And the sun acts like a black body for the sake of this. Um, and if you measure the surface of the sun, if you've got a laser thermometer and measure the surface of the sun, uh, you'd measure around 5,500 Celsius, the surface. I, God knows what that is in Fahrenheit, but five five and a half thousand Celsius, yeah. which equates to 5,000-ish, 5,800 Kelvin. The scales of Celsius and Kelvin are pretty much the same. They're just uh, offset by 273.5, I think. Um, so if you measured the surface of the sun, you'd get 5,500 Celsius-ish which equates to 5,800 Kelvin. And because of what's called Planck's law and a lot of science, we can measure the curve that comes off a black body based on its temperature. So if we know what temperature it is, we then know what the spectrum will be emitted. Now, of course, this is only true for black bodies. So it isn't true, you know, for technically true for only black bodies, right? And another piece of equipment that acts like a black body that pretty much everyone will have seen is a piece of tungsten, the filament in a light bulb. Essentially, for all intents and purposes, is a black body. And you fill it full of energy, you put electricity through it, and you get out radiation. That's what happens. And the temperature of that black body, of the, the tungsten filament lamp, is slightly cooler than the sun, would you believe? Uh, it's 2,700 Kelvin, there or thereabouts. And with that, we can work out a similar curve, right? We can use the same science to work out the curve that would come off a uh, tungsten filament lamp. And it looks like this. Uh, I've multiplied it by 15. I've used uh, a, a, a spreadsheet and calculations from Dur uh, Serena Vunderlich for this. Uh, she's one of the smartest people in the world. Um, but I've, and I've essentially put it into Photoshop and put it over the top of the solar spectrum. Um, and I've multiplied it by 15 for the sake of comparison because otherwise it's really low because the sun is so bright mm -hmm. um, but you can see that the curve of a tungsten halogen lamp uh in it, is it emits a hell of a lot of uv uh, infrared a sorry a heck of a lot of infrared a and you can see there's a little bit of visible light and you can also see there is actually a tiny amount of uva right down there just at the edge of 400 um yeah. it's it's such a tiny you know it's less than one percent uva which again is another pet peeve of mine that they stick uva on the box of heat lamps oh yeah yeah so annoying that because technically it's just... true but... yeah t yeah exactly are we lying to people at that point i don't know but you can see that this lamp is a really good infrared a emitter yeah um and if we compare that to say you know another really popular lamp on the market is the dp projectors that people use they use them on leopard geckos and um, people use them on, on smaller animals uh, the the spectrum that you would get off that again, it's the same thing, right? It, it, it's a carbon filament rather than a tungsten filament, but it works pretty pretty much the same way. Is it's a bit cooler again? It's about a thousand Kelvin, and that looks like this. Now that's it right there. It's tiny. Yeah, yeah. It's it's such a a small, and again, this is multiplied by fifteen. Um, it's such a small amount of of energy that is actually emitted as uh, infrared A or infrared B. In fact, the vast majority is infrared C. And in fact, even more than that is just uh, radiated. <laughs> it is uh, is conducted out into the body of the lamp. Right. It's conducted yeah. out into the air rather than radiated out. Um, so this lamp really isn't necessarily a an infrared A emitter, right? It's emitting pretty much no infrared A in the region of 3% infrared A. So 
again, it's another one of those pet peeves where they stick infrared A on the box or IRA on the box, um, and it's just not really an infrared A lamp. So they don't make great basking lamps, um, but they're great sort of substrate heaters and great uh, ambient air improvers yeah. or in- increases. Um, so that that's that is the area of the spectrum that we're focused on when we consider solar power density, which again is ROM's baby. Um, this is the part of the spectrum that we're focused on. We're focused on the infrared A part of the spectrum. And this is the reason that we can use um, the power density meters to measure things like um, tungsten halogen lamps because they they have a lot of data, data, a lot of energy in this part of the spectrum. So we can use them pretty well for this. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it definitely makes sense. Yeah, and I Good. think... Uh, okay. Um, I, sorry for anyone listening because that's just the least... It's more visual than anything. Yeah, yeah. They'll have to come back to the video. And honestly, with lighting conversations, a video is almost always necessary because it is uh, tougher to- cop- tougher topics to grasp and, uh, you know, visual elements obviously going to help make that Yeah, a it's bit impossible easier. to teach without yeah. showing someone, right? If, even if I'm showing someone, I need to draw out the spectrum on a piece of paper regardless if I don't have a computer with me. Exactly. And, and I think for uh, the... Like I'm glad you explained the temperature thing because that's another confusing aspect of lighting where people, you'll see a bulb that has a certain temperature labeled yes. on it. And, and then to, to make it even more confusing, we call the higher temperatures cool and, and the lower yeah, temperatures warm. Yeah, the reason warm. for that is because they, they're higher temperatures, so they emit more blue light. Yes, yeah. And we consider blue cold, right? That's, that's the yeah. way it So there's like an opposite thing happening there. Yeah, exactly. So the higher the temperature, the cooler the light. So yeah, that is what color temperature is. Um Color temperature is, is associated with black body radiation, and it's associated with the fact that the higher the temperature, the higher the color temperature. Essentially, they're the same thing, right? If you measure temperature and color temperature, color temperature is the temperature of a black body. That's what color temperature essentially is. Right. Um, what we have in LEDs is corrected color temperature, which is what we use across the board pretty much for all Because of it's not glowing. They're not glowing that hot like a yes. tungsten filament is. It's just uh, if a tungsten filament were to glow white hot, it would be around 6,000 Kelvin or something Correct. like that. Yeah. So when we use an LED and you get an LED that is 3,000 Kelvin or 6,000 Kelvin, it's emitting the color that a black body would emit at that at that temperature. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what good color to know. temperature is. Yeah. And I think and one other thing to stay about that too is people, I, I think intuitively people kind of understand this, but also I see, especially on reptile lighting, people will go, hey, I got these 6,500 6, Kelvin, uh, you know, garage lights and my plants aren't doing well i don't i don't understand this well this is where the spectrum becomes so important and and i think as an example we can use infrared you can use a let's say a 2700 halogen bulb that's dimmed everybody can picture that in their mind in a dark room it's just a a warm orange glow Mm -hmm. you could easily go find an led bulb that produces the exact same color but nobody in their right mind would use that led as a heat lamp because you know that it's not not emitting the same same wavelength yeah there's no heat coming off it it's cool and you wouldn't think that and that same thing happens on the other side of the spectrum people will go buy these you know quote-unquote $8 $8 lamps from Amazon and then be confused why they're not doing well. But it's because your eye is only giving you a very small amount oh, yeah, of information. Yeah. Absolutely. Our eyes are lying to us the whole way. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. The whole way through our eyes are lying to us, which is why um, getting spectral data is really important, which is why zoos pay me to get spectral data on the lamps because they can look at them and think everything's fine, but it's not. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to touch on solar meters. Yes. Yes. Let's do um, that. Do you have one? Do you have a solar meter? Yep. It's just behind oh, me. Yeah. He's a good boy. Yes. Uh, so the one that most most people come across is the solar meter 6.5. Usually, if somebody says solar meter, they mean this, right? Which is the solar meter which I have on here. Uh, I have the zoom aid one here, which is the zoom aid. They're actually the identical unit. All the ones on the screen now are identical. Uh, they just have a different sticker on the front. But actually, solar meter makes a range of meters, right? They make the solar meter 10. Which is this one they make the solar meter eight which is this one they make the 6.2 which is this one they make a whole range right they make them for all sorts of different things um and as we said before the the spectrum uh, the spectral response looks like this um and there's a reason we use the 6.5 or the 6.5 r as it's sometimes called there's a reason we use this one rather than say the 6.2 or rather than say the 10.0 or anything like that. the reason we use this one is because it looks very the, the response is very similar to the uh, the D three synthesis spectrum. 
So I can show you, for example, the 6.2 looks like this, right? It's actually quite different. It's not massively different, but it's different enough. And out of the two, if we were to choose one that is closer to Vim and D3, which is what that green line is, the 6.5 is closer. Mm -hmm. Thus, the 6.5 is more suited for measuring D3 active radiation. Um, and hopefully that makes that makes yeah, the, yeah. the reason as to why we use the 6.5. Now, it's just essentially it's a coincidence that it reads UVI, right? We, it could have turned out that Steve Macken designed the other way around, right? That the 6.2 reads UVI. And this one reads microwatts per centimeter squared. Okay, and that's what I was going to ask because this six point two does give you a different. Yeah, it's giving it you. It gives the, you a different unit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, unit, yeah. It re it, it's 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 reading power density is what it's reading, but it's reading power density of UV rather than anything else, right? Right. And it's reading in microwatts per centimeter squared. So similar to the look, the Lux was reading lumens per meter squared. This is reading microwatts of energy per centimeter squared, and the energy is this energy that we see on the screen. Um, lots of multifaceted sort of things, um, which hopefully I'm sort of explaining in, in, in the right layers. Um, there is one other thing that people see. Um, the Solomit 6.5 people will see quite a lot. Uh, the Solomit 6.2 people might come across. But there is another thing, and it's these little cards that you mm. see that people stick under their lamps and it kind of changes to a purple color or something like that. Um, these um, don't do what they say on the box, unfortunately. They're relatively cheap. They're you know $5 for a pack of three or something like that. Um, and what they are is they're, they're a piece of card and they have a die on them. And the die um, is usually some sort of, chem it's a chemical called polydiacetylene. Um, and, and it's usually some sort of mix of polydiacetylene and other things. Um, and it reacts like this, it reacts to a UVA. Um, it's it's not reacting to the vitamin D spectrum at all. And it's not reacting. It's very, very little reacting to UVB. Um, it makes a great little uh, gimmick if you want to put it on nail varnish or a T-shirt or you know something that changes color or a bracelet or something like that, right? Great yeah, for yeah. kids. Completely inadequate for reptiles. And they still sell them for reptiles. They have little reptiles on the, on the card and things like that. It's really annoying. Um, but that's the other one that people come across. And they're kind of the most... The three most common devices used for measuring UV are the 6.5, the 6.2, and some sort of polydiacetylene-based card. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a uh, a bottle of kid's sunscreen for my son, and it, the cap obviously is made of that. Or, or oh, has does a it coating. have that on? So it's just, it's, you know, it's kind of a gimmick, though, because, you know, so, oh, there's UV. Well, every time you take it outside, the cap turns purple. Because, because it's directed to UVA, right? Exactly. Yeah, so. so it's just kind of funny. They're like, my wife is like, oh, no, now we have to put the sunscreen on. It's like, it doesn't matter what the, you know, yeah, what that, the sun is like. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like like I said, it's a fun little gimmick though, right? It's good. Yeah, you it put is, on a yeah. t-shirt and have a t-shirt that changes color when you go outside, all that kind of stuff. I'm all for that. That's quite fun. Not when we're trying to keep a reptile or keep an animal happy and healthy. That <laughs> exactly you know, inappropriate for that purpose. So there's a whole range of meters, right? And we, we tend not to recommend... Uh, for the vast, vast, vast majority of people, uh, anything other than the Solomir 6.5. So we don't recommend any of these. The sort of these um, cheaper alternative versions called like R RGM meters or RG meters or something like that. Uh, don't recommend those. Um, and absolutely, definitely don't, don't recommend the, the test cards. Those things um, are useless. They certainly won't give you a measuring of UVI, which is what we're after. Right. Um, so you wanted to kind of discuss as well what a meter was and how it works. Yes, yeah. Well, I've got a few here, but there's, there's a meter. And you can see um, on the top of the meter, there is a sensor, or at least under there, there is a sensor. We've got a little screen on the front, and then we've got a button on the front as well. And that's, that is literally it. I mean, I've got the inside of one here, if you want to. There's, there's nothing to it, right? It's a screen and a button and a battery. Right? That is literally it. Um, and the way we use one generally is we have our animals. In this case, it's a frog of some kind. Um, we want to essentially measure how far or determine how far away the animal's back is from the lamp. And we put our meter at that level, again, making sure the sensor specifically is at the level of the animal's back. We have the lights turned on. That's really important. Usually we'll have them on for about an hour before testing them to get them to warm up and do all the usual things. We'll point the sensor at the light. We'll press the button. 
and then we'll get a readout on the front of the, on the on the front of the meter and that readout is our ubi and uh, different lamps will produce different readings at the same distance so you might have say a five percent or a ten percent lamp they'll read different depending on you know the fixture and all these sort of different technical things um, and it's up to a keeper to decide or to research, should I say, what UVI is is best for their animal at the basking area. Mm -hmm. So you may have one animal uh, prefers or is best under a UVI of 0.8, another one 2.9. You may even get some animals that need it even higher, 3.5, 4.5. You know, if you've got a bearded dragon, 4.5 is a pretty good basking UVI. Um, there is the Arcadia website has a pretty good... Um, tool for doing this you kind of type in your species and it gives you like you know a, a recommended uvi and it even gives you a recommended lamp of course it's going to be an arcadia lamp they're going to recommend um but uh francis baines um you know has has the the, the famous paper in the uh, journal of zoo and aquarium research uh entitled how much uvb does my reptile need dot 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 mm -hmm. uh, which people can use and people can look up that and they can search their species um and obviously that's it's reptile based right but we we use these now on other animals as well we use them on mammals we use them on birds um it's some zoos even use them on fish um which snake zoo use them on their fish um so that's that's essentially how a meter works now actually in the top of the meter there is a photodiode i can't take it off on that one but uh and it's a little chip that reads light and what happens is light comes in through what's called a cosine corrector. Um, and the cosine corrector is designed to cover what's called Lambert's Cosine's law. Again, you don't need to know this. But there's a cosine corrector that essentially collects all of the light, puts it through a spectral filter, which gets rid of light that isn't needed. So for example, it will remove the infrared, it'll remove the visible light, because this meter only needs to read the UV. Mm. Then what hits the sensor is the UV, and it gives you a reading of UVI. And the way we calibrate them, I'll say we, the way Solar Light Company calibrate them is they have a master meter right, that they have confirmed is correct uh, to NIST standards. And they put that meter under a, a lamp with a sun-like spectrum. So they're actually not calibrated under the sun. They're calibrated under a spectrum similar to the sun. And they test the meter, the, the master meter, and it gives them a reading, say, for example, 4.5. They then move the meter to be calibrated over and they press the button and then they tweak it until it reads 4.5. And they'll do it with UVI 6 and they'll tweak it until it reads UVI 6 and they'll tweak it UVI 9, read UVI 9. And they're all hand calibrated and that is how they're calibrated. Mm -hmm. They're calibrated by a person in a workshop that puts a master meter under, knows that this meter should be reading 9 then gets the one to be calibrated and, made, and, tw and tweaks it until it reads nine. There's actually a little screwdriver point on the front that they literally just tweak a little thing and uh, essentially change some resistance. I don't know the inner workings, but that's what essentially they're doing. Yeah. And when you buy a solar meter, I think I'm remembering you get a little certificate, I think. You do. The... You get a little calibration certificate. Yeah. And they'll, yeah. they'll even, they recommend, um, they recommend like a recalibration thing for it every year or two years, I think. Um, and they'll always say that it's uh, it's calibrated, you know, they'll nearly always say it's calibrated to within 10%. There'll be a little 10% value. And what that means is that it's within 10% of the master meter. Right. So it could be that the master meter reads five. Your meter then could read anywhere between 4.5 and 5.5. And it would, it would technically be calibrated to within 10% of the master meter. Um, now, of course, this is a man-made thing, right? This is a, uh, it's done by a person. Um, and there could be a potential for a problem, of course. So this is what essentially started the idea of um, us wanting to test a, a few more, right? No one's, I think the most that has ever been tested was five or six. Right. And so myself and Serena kind of decided to, to do a bigger test, right? As far as we're aware, there is no independent test of these things, which is quite scary. And it's also uh, worrying if we were to find any problems. So we decided to to do a test, and we we approached um, the AHH, so that's the Advancing Herpetological Husbandry uh, guys, um, for the conference, the AHH BHS twenty twenty three conference. Yeah, and we said, can we can we you know use some space to do to do a test? Uh, and of course, they said yes. That'd be great. Uh, citizen science is wonderful. We can see that they set us up with this amazing space. 
Um, and we we tested a bunch of meters. Um, and it, it it wouldn't be appropriate for me to go any further without you know listing everyone and saying thanks. I'm not going to list them all verbally, but you can see them on screen. Mm -hmm. So many people donated meters. Zoomed literally gave us meters. Reptile Systems provided like 30 meters or something crazy. Um, people provided ones that were uh, like with, with lids missing. People, uh, Jersey Zoo had one that was like movable. You could move the lid and all sorts of crazy stuff. Like so many different meters. And they weren't all just solar meters. Some of them were lux meters. Some of them were power density meters. A whole range of different what we call radiometers. Uh, and we we compiled a bunch of data, and the full data set is available for free online if anybody wants to look further into it. Um, and what we did is we we decided that a solar meter is, as we've discussed, is is uh, calibrated for this spectrum, the solar spectrum. And we can presume that if we took, say, four meters and put them under the same solar spectrum, they would all produce a very similar result. But what we pondered. Um, was the idea of potentially putting them under a spectrum that is not like the sun. So what would happen if we put them under a spectrum of a, if we compared their output from, say, a mercury vapor bulb, which looks like this? Now, for anyone watching, that yes, that's what a mercury vapor bulb looks like. It's not a great spectrum. That's what they look like. Um, or, for example, if we put them under a UVB LED, which looks more like this. So would they all react the same then? We don't know. Or we didn't know. And the whole uh, idea was that we would get a bunch of lights and we'd put them into like dark boxes and we would test the meters under each lamp. Um, it turned out to be a much bigger job than we thought it would be, but it, we did it. So we did it under, there's some UVB LEDs, the first two, lamp one and two. Lamp three was a, a mercury vapor bulb from ZoomEd. Uh, lamp four was a, a discontinued metal halide lamp. Uh, lamp five was a fluorescent lamp, fluorescent bulb, uh, with a sun-like spectrum, inverted colors. And lamp six was a, a, a halogen lamp, a halogen lamp. The idea being that that would essentially be a control for the solar meters. None of the solar meter 6.5s should give a reading under that. So that was essentially our control. Right. Um, and we, we we tested every single lamp, and if, uh, every single meter, and I think we had about 110, something like that, a lot of meters to test. Um, whilst there was also these amazing talks going on in front of us so we had to keep stopping and watching the talk and then carrying on doing meters and locking everything down um whilst also staying quiet because there's talks going on so um so you basically take one meter and then go through each box the uvl uh, well UVL yeah you'd 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 think it would work like that but really annoyingly the meters are different sizes now we only have some solar meters with me but oh. you know, one meter is this big another meter is this big another meter is this big so, so we the distance. Need to have a way of standardizing the distance to the sensor from each bulb. So I kind of, uh, I say Jerry read. I think I did a pretty good job is I made these sort of little jigs that could go in the box and then you'd sit the meter on and it would always center the meter. But it was all, it would also keep it the same distance away from the bulb depending on the meter. So all the solar meters used this jig. All of the, uh, the, the different ones used this jig. All of the... Right. Solar power meters use this jig, so they all were always within the same distance. Um, and you can see the distances on the screen; they're they're slightly different for each one, uh, partly because the bulbs are also slightly different sized. So yeah, yeah. Um, it was really it was it, it was a little bit more work than we thought it was going to be, but we we did get there. Um, and of course, this image is not to scale. Um, so the 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 great thing about this was that it was it was going to be the best science ever ever because if we found something out we would have learned something that we would have we would have discovered that there was a problem or not problem if we didn't find anything out if they were all fine then we would have still learned something we would have learned that they're all calibrated they're all good so no matter what the outcome was we were always doing really good science mm -hmm. and that i found that really really heartwarming to know that no matter what we were always going to have a good outcome right we were either going to learn something Oh, we were going to learn something. There's no, there wasn't a case of oh, we didn't learn anything from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's really good um, because not all experiments um, are, are perceived like that. So we we took the meters and we measured them and and we plotted out the information. And again, the information is available free online. Um, and here's an example. So here's uh, the first LED, and this was a UVB LED. Uh, I believe it was a prototype. 
um, and it had a peak wavelength of around 300 nanometers. Uh, and across the board, most meters were within the average. The average was about 21.8, UVI 21.8. Some uh, meters, which you can probably see on the graph, uh, didn't read within that average. Um, one of them, serial number 02194, read ridiculously low on that on that um, on that lamp. Now that meter read low on all of them. It was a broken meter. So we're okay with that. In fact, it was donated to us as a broken meter. So we knew that was going to happen. Okay. We didn't know if it was going to read low on them all or high on them all, but it was going to read one way or the other. Um, some of them were a little bit off. Some of them were a little bit funky. Um, worthy of note is uh, 1923, which I believe was another one that read low on pretty much every single one. Um, there are three that are the RG meters, the cheap alternative versions. Um, those read low. There was one that read high on everything, and the reason it read high is because it didn't have the plastic top, so light was just hitting it from all angles, and it was reading crazy things. So the vast majority of meters on lamp one, which, remember, doesn't have a solar-like spectrum, read very similarly, right? which is quite a good thing to see. Um, and it was it was quite nice. And what we can actually see from this is that pretty much all, all of the meters, and this was pretty much across the board, is they were all pretty much bang on, right? We we what we found was that the solar meter is well built and well calibrated, right? They're all within a close range of each other. So my meter will be very similar to yours. Yeah. Um, and what we also learned is that they don't necessarily need recalibrating. Um one meter that's worthy of note is solar meter, this one here, 0002. That is the second solar meter 6.5 ever made. Francis brought that for us. Um, and it reads pretty much bang on the average, right? It's, it's And very it's, has it ever been calibrated? Never been recalibrated. No, calibrated when it was made. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, recalibrated, yeah. Yeah, never been recalibrated now. So, and, and it's, it's still, within the average. Still bang on, pretty much bang on the average. And it was across the board, bang on the average. Um, there are some that are older than that one. So remember, that's the 6.5R. The 6.5 was out before that. There are some that were, you know, 2015, I think, 2016, something like that. Um, again, bang on the average. The, the ones that were out on this and on all of them, we kind of knew were going to be out. So there was usually something wrong with them. Either they were the ones with where the sensors had been moved or something like that. So pretty much all of them were um, were broken or, or fiddled with in some way. The ones or that, not a solar meter. Or not a solar meter, such as these ones that are um, the, the cheaper, cheaper ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. And, um, and the other and, thing to note to make sure that people are following along that this is under the UV LED lamp, so that so these are doing a really good job reading the UVI with with a UV LED bulb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's uh, not so, the sun, yeah, not right, a solar exactly. light spectrum. In fact, it's nothing like the sun. Yeah. Um, the there was one thing that kind of was um, at first a little bit worrying, um, and it was lamp four. And it looks like this. The data looks like this. And it was actually the most consistent lamp out of all of them. So most um, of the solar meters and radiometers as a whole read close to the average, which was around UVI 5. And this is the metal halide. Was... Pardon? This is the metal uh, halide lamp. This is the metal halide lamp, yeah. Um, this is a discontinued product. Uh, again, you can see on the graph that that one that read low, read low, and it read low on all of them, so it's not a problem. Uh, same for the ones at the high end. Uh, there's one that read really high, and I'm pretty sure that was the one without a lid. And then the others, you know, they weren't actually that far off. But this was the most consistent bulb out of the lot, um, which is fine. It sounds cool. It sounds like a really good thing for male halides. But what's worrying is that this lamp didn't emit any UVB, um, which which was 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 a shock at the time right um and i'd i'd i tested this this meet this uh, bulb a few months prior with my own meter and i thought oh god here we go either my meter's broke or something's wrong or my spectrometer's broke because my spectrometer's reading no uvb uh so i bought two more solar meters same again um and i messaged francis and serena and said look we need to do something about this so this was kind of the catalyst for testing more to see if, you know, if I was just having some sort of crazy bad luck or 
something was wrong and we've 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 i mean i've tested this lamp constantly since and it does not emit uvb the fact that it does there's a tiny tiny amount here at 314 nanometers tiny amount um so we can take the data and we can we can look at it in a bit more detail and if you remember earlier on i mentioned that the solomia 6.5 um doesn't technically provide a true uvi reading the uvi is is this mathematical formula that we have um and we can apply that we can apply the maths to to the the spectrum to the data and i've even lied a little bit on on this graph right because this is my rendition of of the response of the solar 6.5 if you look at the official rendition which is like this i'll bring that in um, you can see that there technically is activity all the way down to around 400 nanometers. So my graph doesn't necessarily show that, but this graph does. Um, and you can zoom in on that really close. If I zoom in on that really close, you can see this. And this is a logarithmic scale, okay. which for anyone, it just basically means every time we zoom in, we zoom in more. Right? So we're zooming in by one time, by 10 times, by 100 times. And you can see, again, that there is this tiny amount of activity both in the 6.5 and in erythema all the way up to around 400 nanometers which is interesting because that is the area that that lamp emits right so they're they're even up to 400 which we're getting pretty close to visible light here a visible light and, yeah and that's a very low amount but it will it can still cause skin redness on white yeah, skin absolutely. In, in high enough doses you, in know, high enough doses. Is, you know this is tiny so you need a really high dose but right. yes can do yeah um, so we can apply that math, right? We take this data, which is a mathematical formulation, and we apply that to the spectrum or to the information from the spectrum. And you can see that, you know, I've 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 essentially cut that out of my version of the graph, but it, the, the tiny, tiny amounts exist. And we can apply that number. And if we apply the um, the math, we get a UVI of one out of the math. So officially, this lamp emits UVI one according to the math. Right. Which is okay, but it's still a little bit far away from the UVI 5 that we were getting. Um, so we would expect, in theory, a UVI reading from this lamp if we had a perfectly calibrated, perfect UVI device. But it's still not strong enough for me. Right, UVI 1, if it was UVI 4.5 and we were getting an average of 5, I'd be happy. Yeah. The, official, the official reading being UVI 1 is still not quite high enough for me. Um, and I think it has something to do with with this huge spike of of of, uh, of energy of light in the UVA spectrum. In the UVA part of the spectrum, yeah, at around three hundred and sixty five nanometers. Um, to put it into perspective, this spike has around six times as much UVA at that wavelength than sunlight. So it's it's a lot of UVA. There's lots and lots and lots of UVA there in that spike. Like I say, six times more than sunlight. And I think it's that that's playing a role or something in that region. Um, no, we don't necessarily have any, um, uh, any, any, any other evidence of this other than this one test and my guess. But I'm presuming that the sensitivity range for the solar meter looks more, uh, looks more like this, which is kind of like that at the bottom. Right. Uh, again, that's probably not to scale and it's probably not exact, but I presume that the solar meter 6.5 is actually slightly more reactive to UVA than we think it is right. in some way. Now we can test this in theory if we get you know, some laser diodes and we can turn the laser and emit different wavelengths and we can plot the, the reading of a solar meter 6.5. Um, that's a test for another day, I think. But I, I propose that the uh, true response of the solar meter 6.5 is something like this. Mm. Uh, so it's worth noting for anyone listening or watching, this isn't like a warning to throw away your solar meters or anything like that. This is in extremely crazy circumstances with a discontinued bulb that has a ridiculously high UVA, we, we get a weird reading. But for the vast majority of cases, I'm I'm convinced that the solar meter 6.5 is absolutely perfect for what we want it to be. But it so, is a good uh, it's a good case study just to show people that it's so important to buy bulbs from reputable brands that have published uh, solar spectrums yes. and, or, or, or light spectrums because 
you you could think you're getting uh because as a reminder the uv spectrum is just telling you when the skin gets red Correct. and you might think that this this bulb is throwing off enough uvb to create d3 d3 synthesis but it's not at all it's just there's a bunch of energy in the uva w- wavelength which technically would give you some redness in your skin which is what the mm-hmm. uvi is measuring but we're not getting what we actually want from a uvi reading which is that uvb you know uh short wave uva light yeah yeah we want the vim and d part of the spectrum here that's what we right. want yeah um so yeah absolutely and, and equally the lamp could also be emitting uvc on the other side on the very dangerous side Right. Um, either way, it's dangerous for the animal because either you're not providing UVB or you're providing UVC. So, but again, I want to reiterate: this isn't a, a a thing against solar meters. I use it every day, um, and I recommend everyone. I'm changing my mind about this. Right? Do you? Uh, here's a question for you for the podcast: Do you sure. recommend that everyone has a solar meter? It's a tough one. I mean, because they're so pricey. I, mm-hmm. I would say I recommend everybody stick with well-known reptile lighting brands okay. and, yeah, 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 yeah. and then if you you know because that's the math is kind of done for you you can use the the distances and whatnot and eventually if you're somebody that's getting more to the hobby a solar meter is a, an amazing to have once you have a solar meter you won't understand how you set up an enclosure without one but i don't think the person getting a leopard gecko needs to also have a solar meter like that's almost an impossible so right okay yeah cool so like mom and dad buying little timmy a bearded dragon maybe doesn't need one yeah exactly um, yeah, so yeah, I, I keep changing my mind as to whether it should be considered a standard part of the cost of a setup or, but then I, re, you know, then I remember bloody hell, it's 300 pounds. Like, you know, that is the cost of a setup for a lot of people. So exactly. I, every now and then I do, I, I change my mind as to whether it should be recommended. Um, but actually, I've got some information on the, on the distances and why that's, why that's really useful, um, which I'll show you in a bit if you'd like. Um, sure. Yeah, okay, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's fun because my mind changes constantly. That's all. I just I wondered what your what your mind was on that. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a good like I said. It's such a good tool to have. But really? at the same time, if if you're saying to somebody, hey, you got to buy a UV bulb in the setup that's a three hundred dollars or whatever, and you also have to buy this device to prove that the bulb is good, you might go, well, what the hell? Why isn't the yeah, bulb why, just good? What do you mean? I have to yeah. And then and then they say, oh, what does it do? Like and you go, oh, it's just a button and a screen. Like <laughs> yeah. it doesn't doesn't do the dishes for me. And it's three hundred pounds. Like what the heck? But if you have a lot of exactly. enclosures and then, because the, it does easily save you money once you have a couple of reptiles, because Absolutely. then you're not yeah, replacing the bulb yeah. every, you know, six to 12 months or whatever the package says. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like I've got, I've got some T5s in with my, I've got a 6% T5 in, I think it's 6% with my beardy. He's, he's close enough to be getting the right UVI, but it's, I think it's been in there for 18 months, maybe. Oh, and yeah. you're still going to give you like 4.5 out of it, right? So it saves me buying another bulb. Yeah, so, exactly. And, you know, you times that by five over the course of, you know, a few years or even a few reptiles that you've, you've made your money back. Easily, yeah. Um, which leads me actually quite nicely onto how to light an enclosure. Uh, this is something that we um, we see a lot on, uh, like, the reptile lighting group. But I also see it, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a person who... who sits and scrolls through stupid things all the time and often i find myself just scrolling through facebook and um the amount of reptile branded groups that there are on facebook is you know the list is as long as your arm it's really too many in my opinion yeah but the amount of times i see questions about what light should i get how should i set it up what layout should i use um i think it's it's a good idea to kind of touch on that if that's okay with you please absolutely so um, I use the extreme example, um, and I'll use looks here as, as kind of my proxy. Um, uh, the extreme example of a of a jungle or a canopy system. And you've got a little frog in the canopy, and you can measure, uh, say, 500 looks right, in, a, in a little, in a little uh, bit of the jungle. But of course, the jungle isn't always dense, right? There are these patches of sunlight. There are these beams of sunlight going through. And if the frog has a choice always to move into those patches of sunlight all the time, and if we measure the looks in that area, we would get a much higher level of, of a much higher reading of looks. So, in, for example, 115,000 looks. And it's this that we want to do in an enclosure. And of course, looks, you can swap that out for UVI, you can swap that out for power density, you can swap that out for temperature if you really want. You'll always end up with a cooler area of, of, of 
of an environment and a warmer area of an environment. And usually that warmer area or that brighter area or that area with more UVI will be a patch of sunlight. And of course, in a desert, the patch of sunlight is big and the shade is small. Mm -hmm. But the, the concept is still there, right? Now, 115,000 lux is a bit unrealistic for a, um, a, a a setup at home, a more realistic number would be in the region of 50,000 lux. So if we pretend that there's an enclosure, what we've essentially got is a gradient from low light to high light. So 500 lux in the middle, 20,000 lux, and at the high end, 50,000 lux. And again, it doesn't just need to be lux. This can be UVI. You can have a low UVI and a high UVI at the end. Same, you would have low power density and high power density at the end, right? And it's that's because sunlight is all of them at once. Right? It, it, it sunlight has high lux, it has high UVI, and it has high power density in one spot. Yeah. So we can provide that quite well in an enclosure. Um, and I'm I'm aware that you had a conversation with Francis about a year or a year or so ago, and she kind of showed the different spectra of different lamps. And I don't want to butcher what she's done. She's done a really good job. Um, so people should go and listen to that and watch that version. Um, but I can I can pretty much show it. Um, this is the solar spectrum that we saw earlier. Um, hopefully by now people know how to read this, which is mm -hmm. quite a good thing. Um, we know that the um, heat lamp provides that really good infrared, right? So we know that. So we can actually skip that part of the spectrum for the sake of what I'm going to show you. And we can zoom in on the daylight again, and I can turn it into a background. And I can show the heat lamp, right? So we can see that the heat lamp, and it goes off the side into the infrared part of the spectrum. And the heat lamp is really good for that. It provides that infrared, a little bit of visible light, but it provides the infrared primarily. It's really good at that. You can see the tiny amount of UVA that it provides uh, here. I can highlight that with that. And but you can see that it provides no UVB. And again, the visible light is, you know, leaves something to be desired. And this would be basically any inc incandescent heat yeah, lamp, it, it, reptile bulb, you know, whether it's a halogen a, or just incandescent. Yeah, I think this is an Arcadia halogen specifically, but it could be, in theory, it could be any <clears throat> heat bulb. If you plug it in and it glows and gets hot, it's probably a heat bulb. Yeah. Any mid's light. Something like this, it will give off. Yeah. Um, so, of course, that, that's something that pretty much every reptile should have, even if it's a crested gecko or a leopard gecko from a you know bearded dragon or a, some sort of cyclora. They should all have at least this part of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And arguably, they should also always have UVB. Obviously, some people argue against it for some strange reason. Uh, and we can show what a, a standard T5 looks like. Looks like this or something like this. Again, I think this is an Arcadia. Um, and we can see that the UVB, which is down here, again, really good. And that's what it is. It is a UVB bulb. But the rest of the spectrum, again, not very good. The visible light, yes, it does give off visible light, but it's 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 rubbish, ultimately. right? It's not a visible light producer. It's not That's not what it's designed for, yeah. No, it's designed for producing UVB, right? So... It's it's we've got heat lamp which is going to heat or infrared. We've got UVB lamp which is going to UVB, and then in theory, for my minimum standards, I like to see something that's really good at visible light, the, the middle bit, and that's what an LED is really good at, right? An LED is pretty good at filling out that spectrum in the middle area. Again, for a full breakdown of this, go and watch the interview with with Dr. Francis Baines. Hers is a million times better than this, but this is a brief overview of, of what that is. And we can do this in an enclosure, right? We can use these lamps together to create a fairly full spectrum. So here's a, a little example that I uh, use a lot for the bearded dragon groups to kind of show people. Uh, so you've got your little beardy there. Um, I've got a little beardy, his name's Spud, and he's a zero. And whenever I do this, uh, my partner always says, why Why have you not made him like Spud? Like, why is he not gray like Spud is? But it's uh, <laughs> a standard little, like, golden beardy. Yeah. Um, so this is how we would set up a standard, say, 4x2x2 by two by two beta drag enclosure. Um, you could use a heat lamp. Uh, this is the Reptile Systems Gold lamp. Um, it's it's. I really like this lamp. Right, I'm using this as an example because it's got a really wide flood of, of infrared. Is it actually 400 watts? Reptiles? Pardon? Is it 400 watts? Uh, the hottest one is, yeah. 400, oh, my. Yeah. Wow. That's insane. Yeah, you can get, I think, in the... In your market, in the Canadian and the North American market, uh, it, you can get down to 50. I think here the lowest is 75 okay. in the UK. And I think you're 75, 150, maybe 200, 400. I think that's 
um, the 400 watt is yeah, it's a lot of energy, right? I've so never even could, heard of a 400 watt. Second that you could swap that out for a, a 100 100 watt heat lamp, right, or 150 watt heat lamp. I just really like this. Um, I'm slowly moving everything over to this because of the wide beam. Um, and that's another important factor is the, 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 the amount of light that comes off it, the amount of infrared that comes off. Uh, so you'd have that, that bigger infrared, you'd, and you could see the beam, right? That's an approximation of the beam from that thing. It's, it's a beast. Um, you'd then stick on your T5, and this, for example, could be you know an arcade here. It could be a zoom ed, uh, it could be a reptile system if so you wanted to go down that route. And that would have a nice beam as well. Uh, then I would recommend a an LED. And I, this is kind of what I recommend as a minimum, is a, a heat lamp, a UVB lamp, and an LED. And this example is a Arcadia Jungle Dawn, a really good LED. Uh, again, other brands have quite decent LEDs as well. And you can see the beam from that is something like this. Um, something that I like to use, which we've touched on, is the metal halide lamps. Now, the one that's discontinued, obviously, don't use that one. Um, I really like uh, metal halide lamps for their UVA output. Mm. Uh, so I, as a, in an enhanced setup, I would stick a halide in. And you can see if you put those lamps all in one space, you can, there's the beam from the halide. If you put those lamps all in one space, you end up with this sort of blend of all the different spectra in one spot. And that's very similar to the beam of sunlight that we saw with the frog, right? There is your beam of sunlight. And you can move the the, the animal can move out of that into the shade if wanted to. And this is controlled, right? This is a controlled area. So we can control the temperature in this area. We can control the UV by changing the bulb. We can control the brightness of the LED by changing the LED. And we can we can kind of fine tune this area for our animal and always give them the chance to go into the shade. Yeah. Um, in this example, I use a, a fan as well because I've started putting fans on all of my enclosures now. It's just kind of a fresher um, thing. Uh, it also helps with, with thermal control of the, of the enclosure. In the UK, we have a lot of wooden vivs. Yes, yeah. Um, so it's we don't get the, the mesh venting like, like many people do in the States. Um, and that is kind of, I mean, that's literally my Bearded Dragon's enclosure, right? That is... That is essentially what a bearded dragon has now. Um, obviously, he's got a, a food dish and a water dish and places to climb. But that's in terms of lighting, that is yeah, that yeah. is his enclosure, and that is the minimum that I recommend. Well, that is an enhanced version, but that is what I would recommend for for anyone really. Um, and so, I do the same for all animals, pretty much. So, so moving on to a different animal species, for example, because the halide is going to throw off heat as well. Yes. So when you have, you know, you have your 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 halogen bulb let's say and then you have this halide to get the uva but you're also getting infrared so if you were to do this with a a, a cooler species well, how yeah would you... so i i i i do it with um i do it with i do it with some cool species. i do it with my boa constrictor okay uh, that, you know isn't a desert dwelling animal um the halide technically does produce some infrared but actually a lot of the heating isn't for infrared a lot of the heating is conduction um into the into the device itself and it's a lot of it is visible light. So if you put your hand under a halide beam, what you're feeling is visible light heating you up. There's so much okay, of it. Okay. Um, but yes, there is there is a heating element to it. Yeah. Um, which is partly why I use the fan, um, and partly why I make sure that the the wattage of the lamps I'm using is controlled. Right. So I don't use a 400 watt heater and a an 150 watt halide and all this crazy stuff with my bogus, which right. I use slightly lower wattages. And I have more fans to kind of blow fresh air through. Gotcha. Um, and the fans are, aren't on all the time. They're on a thermostat. So when the th when it gets too hot, they bring fresh air through. Um, again, this is, this is, I wouldn't recommend this sort of full-on setup for uh, mum and dad buying little Timmy a bearded dragon for his bedroom, right? That's This isn't what I would recommend. This is somebody who wants to advance that a little bit more. But I would recommend they use an LED still. I still would sure. recommend that. And then are you dimming? Like, do you dim the bulbs at all? Like, are they on an outlet, on an outlet dimmer or anything, or do they run full power? No, and then um, the fan they is they the are on control? a thermostat dimmer. They're on a thermostat dimmer. But oh, they are okay. It, uh, but it doesn't ever get used. Right, it's a um, fail safe. They are on it just for safety reasons, right? For, for basic. But the the idea of a uh, of a, a dimming thermostat, at least, um, from a kind of uh, what's the word from 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 the perspective of of, of damage control and a monitoring how many things can break um or from an engineering perspective if you like it's one more thing that can go wrong yes yeah 
and a a thermostat can fail. Of course it can. But the worst possible situation is the thermostat fails in on position, full yeah. on. Right? That can happen. Um, and if it did, there should always it should, the enclosure should still always be safe. Yes. So we should we should minimize uh, problems by making sure that our enclosure is safe, even in the event of all lights being on full blast. Yeah. So I make sure I test the I test the setups before I stick an animal in to make sure that even in a hot room, in with the lamps all on full blast, if the thermostat failed, the animal would still be able to get to a place that's cool enough. Yeah. It may well be that the, the hot part of the enclosure is maybe touching on too hot, but as long as they can always get to a cool part, I'm 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 happy with that. Yeah, and that's the exact same thing I operate on as well. So I think there are two key things. A making sure you're not buying bulbs that are way too powerful for what you're trying to do. Yeah, so if you wattage, yeah. you can get a 25 watt bulb that's on full and that then you don't have to worry about the dimming thermostat. And then the other thing is space. You, you, you know, if you're dealing with a tiny enclosure, you yes. could overheat that. You know, I have six foot enclosures behind me. The, the one side is always going to be in the 20, yes, 22, exactly. 23, 72, 73 degrees Fahrenheit. It's There's no issue there ever. Yeah, this is one of the reasons that... Um, I, I dislike seeing the idea of you know bearded dragons being sold in twenty gallon, forty gallon enclosures. Right? Yeah. I'm sure you've had people on who've talked about this enough um, about the concept of of enclosures that are tiny. Yeah, um, it's one of those things that I uh, I'm I'm really worried about is the amount of people that I see on groups that have got tiny enclosures. Um, that is, and I, I don't know what the answer is. So in the UK, at least we have what's called the Animal Activities License or the AAL. And it means that a pet shop is no longer allowed to sell a bearded dragon in anything smaller than a four by two by two or 120 gallons. Right. So in the UK, it's now illegal to sell them in anything smaller because of thermal gradient, because of what we call the five freedoms. Yes. Um, yeah. It's, so it's it's kind of um, it, it worries me that in a lot of places um, they're still selling them and people are still buying them in, in essentially a tiny fish tank. I well, mean, that's my the thing. Keyboard is the size of the tank there, and it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they if they if you sell them in a t- tiny tank, and then they go, okay, I'm going to save money on the enclosure, but I'm going to buy all the lighting. I would rather you not buy the lighting. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because you're yeah, going to end up with an overheated animal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, for the metal halides, where are are those reptile branded, or are those just a standard bulb, or where do you get those? So, um, in fact, I was actually talking to uh, to Mariah Haley about this. Um, Reptiles. Two, two, three days ago. Yeah, reptiles. Um, because I I was writing this blog post and I mentioned halides in the blog post, and she kind of commented on it and said, Oh my goodness, I wish I wish halides were available in the States. Um, and you do have a few in your part of the world. I think Zoomed have one that is pretty, pretty okay. But like, those is a, a fantastic halide. It's probably my favorite UVB emitting halide, but it doesn't at UVB. Mm. Um in the UK, we're a little bit more lucky because we're a bit closer to Europe, and in Europe, they use them all over the place. And um, we can get ones that don't emit UVB, so we get like human grade ones that are still fairly available, not necessarily in a in a shop, but you can get them on Amazon, get them on eBay, um, pretty readily available. These halides. Um, I in some enclosures I will use ones that emit UVB, and in some enclosures I don't. Um, regardless, I will always use my spectrometer to make sure that what I'm creating is a full spectrum. Uh, so, for example, with my Egyptian tortoises, they have one, um, they have three kind of basking areas because it's quite a large enclosure. And the one in the middle has a UVB emitting one because that I want that to be kind of the highest, hottest, brightest point. Then I have two kind of slightly lower UV, slightly lower temperature, lower power density uh, spots. And those just have daylight. Um, human grade halides. So those don't have UVP ones. Okay. Um, in terms of the ones that I like, the Philips one is really good. The Philips Master Color. I don't know if you can get that over there. Uh, General Electric or GE also have one. It's really good called the Constant Color. Um, but in the States, the one that I recommend the most is the is the, uh, the Zoom Ed one. Okay. It's a really good halide um because it, it's it's quite small as well they've got like a weird shape to them um but the the light they give up is bright 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 white light um and in, in a setup like this where you could have 
it mixed with other lamps, the color rendering would be great as well. The color rendering on its own is a bit, um, but it, with a mix of lights, you would get a great full spectrum out of it, a really good full spectrum out of it. I, I want to say if you go to like a hydroponic store, like a garden, garden place, you might find some grow bulbs. Yeah, that... the irony is that a lot of, uh, they used to be used a lot in aquariums, like big, big like sea life or sea world or whatever. Like big aquariums for like, you know, you see the tanks and it's got sharks swimming around and all that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. They use them in those because they're so bright. And nowadays it's all LEDs because they're just so much more efficient. Um, but the halides produce this UVA and the fish can see it. And so it's, it's, it's ironic that we're moving away from it. And ironically, as part of my job is recommending lamps for zoos. I'm asking them to get them back, which is really funny because they just spent all this money on getting LEDs. LED, instead yeah. I'm not coming in and saying, no, get rid of, you know, add, add halides instead. Um, it's, yeah, it, it, they, they are a, a a great lamp. Finding them is is the hard bit, especially in the States. I Like I said, the Zoom Ed, I don't, I know the Exoterra had one, but that's the one that's discontinued. Okay. Um, I don't know of any other major brands. Maybe is do you guys get Solar Raptor over there? That's a German. I think brand. so. Not in Canada, yeah. that's for sure. We 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 have see we have quite a few because in in Europe they're used and it's a little bit easier to get them because of that. But um, I, I, for most people, I would recommend. Um, I've actually I've I've done the measurements with the Zoomed one next to T fives and things like that, so that I can recommend it. So that I know, obviously, it will add a UVI reading, right? So you need to, if your beta dragon needs a UVI of 4.5, you can dr make the distance a little bit more if you're adding a halide. Yes, yeah, that makes sense. So you could use yeah. the ZoomEd one and just kind of do the math. And I, I, well, I've, I've done the math so that people can, uh, so that people know how far away to get it, which is actually the next point of this is, is how far away do I put these lamps, right? And but, before, you, before you say that, can I say one more thing about the, the metal halide? Because you had mentioned that it's not producing any infrared, really. I, I I don't really understand why like why is why does a tungsten filament lamp produce an infrared spectrum but not the halide or the because I guess I know they're they they completely different apparatus yeah, for crea um, creating light but it's a really good it's a really good question um so yes a halide does produce infrared um but the majority of the infrared it produces is infrared C okay right and the reason Radiating, for that, yeah. So the very longest of the wavelengths. And yeah. even then, a lot of the heat it gives off in terms of if you touch it and it gets hot is just conduction. So what you'll find is that the fixture gets hot, which is actually one of the biggest downfalls of halides is because they're designed, uh, they, they don't work very well in hot environments. So it's it's they have to have really good kind of um, sinking mechanisms to kind of get the heat away from the, the, um, the arc tube inside because otherwise it fails. Right. That's actually a, a, one of the biggest problems with halides is that, you know, I mean, they produce light for years as long as they're looked after. If you keep it in a in a tiny thing, the, the zoom in one has these sort of vents that pull the air through and all this to try and get fresh air through it because otherwise it will fail. Um, so it's 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 not a black body, right? So it doesn't produce the same curve that we saw earlier mm. um, because there is no tungsten filament inside. It's a it's a tube filled with types of metal that are called halides and they ignite and glow in different colors and if you look at the spectrum of a halide which i don't think i included in the presentation but the spectrum of a halide is very very spiky i can say go and watch franz right you'll see you'll see this really spiky spectrum and that is literally the halides the pieces of metal glowing in those colors that's gotcha. what that is and when they're giving off energy they're giving it off in that wavelength and not in the infrared wavelength whereas tungsten because it acts like a black body, heated in the way it's heated through resistance, it does act like a black body and it produces infrared. Gotcha. Um, does that does that make sense? Yeah, <laughs> no, totally. That that totally makes okay, sense. Okay, good. That yeah. was an off the cuff uh, answer as well. So yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, so how far away do we have these lamps? Right, it's all well and good me saying get a T five, get a heat lamp, get an LED. How far away do I have the the bloody thing? Um, and this is where the meters do come in, right? Um, but you don't always need a meter, of course, because we've, I say we, myself and plenty of other people have done the math for you. Um, and the way we would normally do it is you would take a, a lamp, say an Arcadia Pro T5 with a lamp, some sort of bulb in it, 
Um, and you would measure the meter, you would measure it, say, 10 centimeters, you could measure it 20 centimeters, and you get a different reading, depending on how far away you are from the lamp. And we've done this, right? We, we plotted this out. So, for example, we could be this far away from the lamp, and we would have 4.5, and we could plot that out on a graph. And we could do the same for 3.5, and we could do the same for 2.5. And what we essentially end up with is a map of how far away you need to be from the lamp to get a certain UVI reading. And this makes perfect sense if you want to have, say, a bearded dragon. You could bring your bearded dragon in. We've done the same for heat lamps as well. I've kind of pushed a lot of this. I've done the solar power density ones on heat lamps. Um, and these are dubbed, um, I think Fran came up with the idea of naming them the ISO irradiance charts. Um, I don't know if you can hear that outside my window. There's some magpies having a fight. <laughs> um, it's crazy <laughs> no, magpies near where I live, and they're always fighting. Um, <laughs> So yeah, Fran came up with the idea of calling them ISO irradiance charts. This was back in the day, um, which makes sense. I like to call them irradiance maps or uh, like spread diagrams because it essentially shows you the spread of light that comes off a lamp. And you can use examples with with animals, right? So you can say an, an animal, the a bearded dragon, for example, if it is this far away from a lamp, it will get UVI in this example one or between one and two. Equally, we could say that if an animal is X close to a lamp, it would get a different UVI. And we can use this to recommend lamps and distances to people who don't have meters. And I think we touched on that idea earlier, the idea that, you know, I can say you'll get UVI 4.5 at 30, 25 centimeters from a 6% Pro T5. Yeah. I can say that. I can say that to someone. I can say, get a Pro T5, have it 25 centimeters away. It'll be fine. And that is because we've done this, this math. And... That is one of the reasons we recommend these brands is because their output is consistent. So we've done it not just with one bulb, we've done it with 10 bulbs, 20 bulbs, 30 bulbs. And we know that consistently they produce the same UVI at the same distance there or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the brands that you find that, you know, you can't pronounce the names because you go on Google or you go on Amazon and you type in T5 and it comes up with some a, a brand that you've never heard of and you can't pronounce the name they will have completely inconsistent outputs. And they do, we've tested them. So I could have one and it reads UVI five at 20 centimeters. I could test another one and it reads UVI three at 20 centimeters. Another one reads UVI 20, at 30, like they're completely inconsistent. So the re one of the reasons we recommend these good brands or these, the, the well-known brands is because they're consistent as well. Yeah. And you know this, of course. Um, and equally, we could do the same for a video dragon in, in the power density, we could say recommend uh, 300-ish watts of uh, per meter squared of, of, of solar power density. And we could recommend that a bearded dragon should be 25, 30 centimeters away from this bulb. And it's not just reptiles, right? This is something that I do. This is quite a lot of wants, I'm sorry. Um, it, this is something I do, and I've, I've done it with a zoo recently for mammals, right? So here's some rabbits and some guinea pigs. And they are using um, a thermal zoo pro from Arcadia. You've seen those? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I've kind of uh, adjusted the Thermal Zoo Pro to stick in different heat lamps. My favorite ones are these Exoterra ones because um, they have a nice wide spread. And I just know in the top of my head, like how far away things should be. Um, and I've stuck in, I think I've stuck in a 12% and I measured it and I recommended uh, certain setups for different animals. Now, this was a proof of concept. Um, obviously, a rabbit can jump on top of the lamp, so we can't use it like this. But this is a proof of concept as to how one could be used for an animal. Um, and this is for a zoo, right? The idea is that these animals, uh, especially guinea pigs, I mean, guinea pigs live in like Peru, right? They live in some of the hottest, hottest parts of the world, right? So it makes perfect sense to give them UVB. And in fact, there's a lot of studies on guinea pigs and UVB. Um, so many studies. And, and one of the biggest recommendations I had for this zoo was definitely give these guys UVB because it would be really good for the animals, but also a really good talking point for people who come to the zoo. They could say, oh, I have a guinea pig at home. I don't provide lamps and you could get the education team, the keepers team to explain that to people. And by doing it, you could potentially help, you know, hundreds of animals at home. Yeah. Kinda, it kind of makes you wonder how many pets that people keep should have full spectrum lighting. I mean, I guess you shouldn't be wondering about it. It should just be a fact that probably if you're keeping mammals and things like that, there should be maybe more incorporation of, of light. Yeah, exactly. And this is one of the things that the zoos are pushing a lot more is, is the idea of lighting mammals. Um, and birds, of course. I mean, birds are reptiles, right? They they benefit from UVB. The exact, I mean, all animals do, but they the, the birds 
that are closely related to reptiles, so closely related that they essentially are reptiles. Yeah. And people don't provide them with UVB, and it blow, it, that, that does blow my mind. Um, and I, in fact, I, flamingos, right? They're a bird that people sometimes don't think about as a bird, but I, I <laughs> recommend the same thing for the birds, for the, for the flamingos. And this is a, a big hydroponic uh, T5 unit. It holds eight uh, T5 lamps. So I've kind of plotted that out um, and and recommended it for the, for the flamingos for their, when they're indoors in the wintertime. Because um, at the moment they're brought in a winter and they don't get given UVB, but these things are from the Caribbean or they're from Africa, right? The hottest parts of the world. Right. So they, in theory, you know, in these parts of the world, they don't get areas of well, they don't often find that they don't have a high UVI reading, right? These things get sun all year round in the wild. Why don't we provide in captivity? Well, maybe we should. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know of a zoo that provides UVB for the flamingos yet. But have me back in a year or two, and hopefully I'll have we'll find some a couple. Yeah, um, and again, we can do more than one of these units, right? This is a big, it's it's huge. This thing, it's like a meter, and you know, it's it's a big thing. We can put multiple of them, multiple of them together, and we can then measure the UVI, and we get this huge space, and we can use it for larger animals, so things like rhinos, right? And we can we can create a dedicated basking area for rhinos, which is again another animal that lives in some of the hottest parts of the world in some of the harshest climates right in fact they've got really thick skin that potentially could be another defense mechanism against the, the harsh sun that they get yeah um they you know they, especially the african rhinos right there you look at a picture of an african rhino and it's not in the shade it's in the sun and it's in the sun all day and in captivity they just not provided uvb yeah this is the this is the concept of that um and this does i know these aren't <laughs> animals at home but this does kind of apply uh, a little bit is that some animals are really difficult to light. So for example, giraffes, right? Um, a giraffe like this, this again, a proof of concept, completely undoable because its neck could be getting one UVI right. and its, its back could be getting a completely different UVI. And then its head could be getting maybe too much UV. And then this doesn't take into consideration the fact that this thing has a tongue that is, you know, a meter and a half long that could then just touch the lamps. Right? Yeah. So they, they, some animals are really, really difficult to light. And this is where I, I've been dealing with these halides in Switzerland, is because this is what the halides are designed for, is they're designed for high output. And I tested um, I tested one, it's from a company called LIH, and I was, I was about three and a half, four meters away from this thing on the floor. And I read a UVI of 12, which is ridiculously Whoa. high. And I was very far away from the lamp, right? It, 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 like I said, it was three and a half, four meters away. Um, so something like that would be ideal for, say, an elephant, right? These mm-hmm. things are designed so you can put them really high up on the roof, blast them in an area, and the, the a, an animal such as an elephant could have a really consistently broad UVI or UVB exposure. Um, I mean, elephants are a big one. In, in, in the zoo world, just as like a hint, especially in the Northern Hemisphere, pretty much every primate has low vitamin D3, uh, serum D3, so in the blood. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah, um, and the way they get around that is just orally supplement them. Sure. Um, my argument is just give them a light bulb. Yeah, and especially, they, I mean, they, all they these animals. Sense, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, especially because a lot of them in the winter are not going to be outside at all, right? They're going to yeah, be inside. Outside no, they they... They have access to outdoors, but not going to go outdoors. Especially like a gorilla, it's not yeah. going to want to go outdoors. It's, it's essentially it's a it's like a person, right? I don't want to go outdoors in the winter. So yeah. Um. So anyway, that's that's kind of that. And and in fact, these things have different reflectors, so they can get them in really wide. They can get them in really narrow. Um. And when I was doing the presentation, that kind of the idea of the narrow and the wide brought me back onto the idea of doing it for animals at home, right? Which is what which is what this is. So. That then reminded me to to focus more on things that we do at home with reptiles or animals that we have. And it reminded me of the idea of PAR. Um, and, and, it, and something that I see a lot is people recommending PAR halogens. Now, PAR, depending on who you ask, means different things. So if we're talking about a halogen, um, it means parabolic aluminized reflector. That's literally what it means. If you talk about plants, 
it's photosynthetically active radiation. So they're completely different things, right? So you could have an LED that has a high PAR value, but you could also have a PAR38 halogen lamp. And the PAR on that is completely different things. Right. That's just um, another th- a confusing thing for the dad. Yeah, the and it's, it, obviously it's really important that people know that because if they raid on a, a, a beta dragon group that I need a PAR lamp and then they go on Amazon and type in PAR lamp, they're going to get a potentially an LED that has a high PAR value. Right. And it's, it's not the same thing. Uh, people recommend PAR halogens a lot. Um, so PAR 38s or PAR 30s. And I can show you what that means. So a halogen um, is a capsule, a little usually anyway it's a little capsule um with a little spiral of tungsten inside the same way a normal heat bulb is but inside that capsule is a halogen gas and what that does is it allows the tungsten to burn hotter and if you remember when we burn hotter we bring our spectrum more like the sun so a halogen burns at around 2800 kelvin whereas a normal heat lamp maybe 2600 Mm. so it's actually you know it's close to the sun right so in theory, it's better for that purpose. Um, but what PAR is, is PAR just means that it's inside a lamp, a, a body. So the, the halogen capsule is inside a larger body. And it's that that is the PAR. That is the, the, the PAR value. So for example, PAR 38 is 38 eighths of an inch wide. Okay. That's what that means. And there's a whole range of them, of course. There's the PAR 20, PAR 30, PAR 38. And there's even like random ones like PAR 34, which is like a weird, um, in fact, I think the zoom ed halide is a PAR 34 potentially. So when you see PAR um, on a halogen bulb, it's really just talking about the size of the bulb, essentially. There's, it literally like, is talking about the size of the bulb. Yeah, in, the in size of the case. The yeah. Yeah. Nothing to do with plants. Uh, and it's also nothing to do with a uh, flood lamp. People right. say, get a PAR 38, it's a flood. Nothing to do with that. Well, I say that it's something to do with that, but not always to do with that. What actually plays a bigger part in in um, in flood lamps is the lens on the front of the bulb. So here's two options. The top one is a uh, an Arcadia uh, 75 watt, I think, halogen, and the bottom one is a prototype. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say who, so I'm not going to say, but it's a prototype halogen. Again, a 75 watt halogen. Um, and you can see the lens on the front is different. Now, this actually takes me back to working in TV and film because we use different lenses in TV and film for uh, different lighting effects, and they use them in theater. Um, a big brand in the theater and lighting for TV and film world is a company called Ari, and they make these big, big halogen, you know, these like three kilowatt beasts sort of thing. And they're also just, a lot of the time, they're just the capsule. And if you look at them the wrong way, they explode. They 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 these stupidly powerful lamps. They're always exploding because they're really sensitive, and they have different lenses. And oh, that says prismatic twice. That's a mistake on my little presentation there. <laughs> uh, that should actually say NSP, and NSP uh, means narrow spot, and that's what that kind of lens is. It's a narrow spot lens, and you can see, in fact, when dealing with them in uh, lighting, TV, and film, we call them narrow, medium, wide, and super wide. And the super wide is a prismatic lens. And the narrow is an NSP, which is a narrow spot. So halogen, the Arcadia halogen lamps, which I think a lot of them are called, I think at least the 100 watt is called a flood. It's not a flood technically because it uses a narrow, an NSP lens. Mm. Um, And you can see that. So here is my example of a halogen with an NSP lens. Um, I've blurred out all the names because I don't want to, make it look like I'm having a go at one brand versus another. But here is a uh, an NSP. This is the style of lens that it has. And then this is the actual output of the lamp. And you can see that it's a heck of a beam on it. Um, for example, if we brought in our beta dragon, we'd need to be about um, you know one, 120 centimeters away. So that's over a meter away from the lamp to be getting a, a sig- you know a normal amount of infrared from the lamp. It's quite far away. Not many people that I know have a uh, a, a 120 centimeter tall enclosure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, versus, say, a uh, one with this prismatic lens on it, you get a much wider beam. It's, it's not perfect, but it's a much wider beam. And again, the Beta Dragon could be much, much closer to this lamp. So it's like the dimples in the glass and the lens sort of diffuse the light out of the bulb to just Correct, a wider yeah. beam. 
some people call it a refractor lens, but I think refractor is a bit of a misnomer on that basis. Um, you can also see what's called a Frenzel lens, which again, it's a TV and film thing, but it's like a bunch of concentric circles. And the idea of that is that it sends a, a very, very tight beam that is controllable. Gotcha. Um, and then you can, in TV and film, you can move the halogen capsule around and, and change the beam shape. Gotcha. Um, but I, it, I find that a lot of the brands now are moving towards these prismatic lenses. I mean, like I said, this one specifically is a prototype uh, from one of the big brands. Um, and they're moving the, from the clear face to the prismatic lens instead. Um, and I've specifically requested and been allowed to give uh, information on a, on a lamp from Reptile Systems, which is a, uh, it's a brand in the UK, but they're also based in France. It's kind of a weird one. Um, in which they've kind of noticed that the, the, the lamp itself, when it blows, the only piece that's actually blowing is generally that little capsule. The little capsule at the bottom is the thing that blows. And it seems like a massive waste. In fact, I think they say it's 85% plus um, of the, the weight of the object has been thrown away and it doesn't need to be. Yeah, you so have the threads, they, the casing, the, the lens yeah, all on this top. Crap, yeah, it's, it's this, the glass on the front, the aluminium. Um, it, there's so much being wasted, right? And there's so much just going to landfill. Most of it doesn't get recycled. It makes much more sense to just replace the piece that's actually blown, right? The rest of it, the integrity is still there. Mm -hmm. um, so they've designed a product in which you just replace the capsule. Now, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't have a name yet, but this is a product that they they are uh, pushing for at the moment. I'm going to be testing a few. I'm going to be creating some irradiance charts for them. Uh, and this one has the prismatic lens, and they've so far the prismatic lens has worked the best on this lamp because it produces that widespread it's not a tight beam anymore so would this be a bulb where essentially you might have to screw the lens off to get access to the capsule yeah, have they decided the, that i think the i think it sort of unscrews if you can see my about here okay so like halfway down the body you can I take think it apart. so yeah from, yeah from what i remember that's how it is but i'm like i said i'm getting one well i'm, I'm, I'm getting a batch of them soon and I'll, I can I can let you know, yeah. but um, yeah, I think it's around here that it unscrews. Um, the The problem with this is that I can the biggest thing I can see they're gonna have a problem with is the idea of touching the halogen. I was just gonna say that, yeah, yeah. So the oils people, on your fingers. People often say don't touch the halogen, but actually, you can. In theory, you can touch this part. Obviously, not when it's on; it'll be really hot. But the thing that blows is actually the capsule on the inside, and that's what shouldn't be touched because your oils on the skin get on that and it creates hot spots and it creates failure points on the yeah. capsule. If anyone's so changed like the, their headlights in a, in a car, that's always like the number yeah, one exactly thing. Right. Do not you touch the bulb. Push it in and 20 minutes later it'll be blown, right? Yeah. So I think that's what they're going to have the biggest problem with. I don't know if every single one should come with like a piece of tissue to push it. I don't know how they're going to do that in terms of marketing it because I can imagine that becoming a problem. Yeah, uh, just wear gloves. Yeah, but then, then you end up being, is this counterproductive in terms of uh, wearing gloves and then you're throwing them away. Oh yeah, yeah, that's true. The perspective of having to say, you know, saving from landfill, um, unless you like reuse the gloves. I don't know what else you want to do with them. Um, but yeah, a piece of tissue would work fine, right? You put a piece of tissue in your hand and push it in. Yeah. I don't. I don't know how they're going to do it. Um, and the other thing I'm pushing them for to do is to is to limit the amount of packaging that is on this capsule because otherwise, again, it defeats the purpose. Yeah. The exactly. whole point being that we're reducing the stuff that's going in, into the bin. Uh, if it comes in a big package that's full of polystyrene to protect the capsule, then it's kind of... Defeats uh, the purpose. Yeah, defeats the purpose completely. Um, and I think that is the end of my presentation. Well, that is... I'm sorry uh, for talking so much. No, Thomas, that was amazing. It's uh, I didn't have to say much. I could just get to watch and learn. And yeah, I think I'm, so, for, I'm so for sorry. People, no, that's, that's, that's amazing. I think, like I said, there's just it's just so confusing for people. There's just so much to cover. And uh, I think that really does give a lot of people a ton of information. I, one question I did have when you when we're talking about the the uh, the way we use lamps to replicate the solar spectrum, uh, I don't know if you maybe you could dial back to that image. Um, I think it was it was quite a ways back, or like maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. however many slides. Because I just have one one question about that. So so okay, this is a like we said. Um, this LED curve is following the solar spectrum quite well. But now we have this headspace between the actual production of light and what the, what we get from the sun. So there's this yeah. gap above. I, 
in I guess what we we might call intensity or or yeah, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so is, is that something on. that we'd want to close? Is that a gap we want to narrow? Uh, yes. So it's worth noting that this graph is uh, the two spectra are not to scale. So um, I've 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 increased the scale of the LED in order to have it compared to sunlight. Right. Gotcha. Um, so the the you can't compare these two spectra to each other um, in terms of intensity. That's why I've I've removed the intensity from the side of the from the right. y-axis because I don't want people presuming that LEDs have somehow the same intensity. Yeah. Um, perhaps I could have written on the bottom, don't compare, but either way, um, yeah. This is uh, these two are not uh, comparable in intensity. They're only comparable in spectra. So they're only comparable on the x-axis, not the y-axis, for the sake right. of this graph. Um, the answer is yes. In my opinion, we should close the gap. Um, but closing the gap uh, is very difficult to do in an enclosure or anywhere really man-made because the amount of energy it takes to close the gap, it defeats the purpose. And you end up putting so much energy into the enclosure that it gets too hot. Right. And the lights um, would be insane probably in there, like reflecting off everything. Yes. Well, it, it, like I say, in sunlight, if you were to go outside on a sunny you know, an open sunny day, you would get 120,000, 130,000 looks, yeah, quite yeah. high looks. Um, a, a typical sort of bearded dragon enclosure with a heat lamp and a UVB bulb at about 40 centimeters away, about 13, 14 inches, you'd get a lux of about 4,000. So absolutely nowhere near, right? Completely yeah, orders of magnitude less. Right, 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 right. So the, the LED will boost the lux partially artificially because of that curve that it matches the looks value uh, but it will increase the brightness because it is adding more light right but by definition and the 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 gap is the gap is going to be huge right and, i mean if i if i sort of draw with my my mouse the the, the peak of the blue would be around here right so we're, we're, we're not even close really no one here no no one here um to get an LED that would be that bright, you would either need to be sort of this far away from the LED, so the looks would be higher, or you need so much energy in the LED that it would get too hot and fail. Right. So producing the looks, uh, or the uh, in truth, in, in producing the brightness is very difficult to do, which is why I usually recommend, if we go back a little bit further to the frog, I recommend about 50,000. Right, okay. Because getting 100,000 plus is so difficult to do. Even fifty thousand is quite a lot. Um, I get I get sixty five in with my adult Herman's tortoise who's in the shed, and he has what eight nine lights maybe in there. Um, two halides, two LEDs, heat lamp, T fives, another LED across. Yeah, he has a, he has a whole bunch of lights. Right. Um, and even then, I'm only getting about sixty five thousand looks. Um, are the lux meters on uh, like when you can download the iPhone like app for lux meters? Are those pretty bad? Or are those kind? Are they okay yeah, to use? Um, coincidentally, and it's purely coincidentally, is um, the sensor on a the CMOS sensor on a camera. Again, this is TV and film stuff, right? So this is kind of where the things overlap. The sensor on a camera um, reacts very highly to green light. And this is actually why you use green screen and not blue screen or red screen anymore, because there are more green pixels on a sensor than there are blue or red. Gotcha. Um, so there's more data to be collected. Coincidentally, Lux is also green. So coincidentally, the sensor on the chip on the uh, on the camera or on the phone or whatever it is also reads higher to green compared to blue and red. Again, similar to looks. So weirdly, it, it, they can work. And when we've we've tested them, some of them are pretty close. I don't quite know how it does it because it's a it's a digital signal and not an analog signal, right? It's not collecting an analog signal the same way a looks meter is. Right. It's collecting green, red, blue, green, red, blue, green. It's not collecting, you know, it's not collecting light, it's collecting pieces of light. Um, so I'm not hundred percent sure on how it works. Um, in turn, there's got to be a mathematical formula that's applying. Um, I wouldn't use one personally. Um, I imagine, I imagine there'll be some sensors in the new iPhones and 
things like that that are pretty good at, at and it'll use things like that via an API. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't trust one just because I don't trust the idea of it being a digital signal and what we're measuring as an analog. Um, right. It's light as analog in the in the in the sense of in the sense of what we're talking about, light as an analog signal and not the digital signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, it, it's not the yeah. super crucial measurement, I guess. And I guess if it's in a pinch uh, for a home keeper, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. If it, it'll it'll probably give you something close. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't. Um, if it's free, whatever, use it. I mean, I, that's something people could do. People could use that and then buy it. I mean, looks meters they're like thirty pounds. What's that? Oh, like? they're they're okay. They're relatively cheap. Then. Thirty-five dollars, forty dollars. Yeah, it's it's and you know. It's fairly cheap, considering the um, cheaper than a solar meter. Yeah. Uh, so for the sake of that, I would just get one of those. And even then, they are all different to each other. So right. the Lux meters, because Lux is designed for human vision. Um, sorry, it's 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 Lux is a measurement of human vision, human vision of perception of brightness. Um, it's only really a proxy anyway of, of true brightness. So using it in an enclosure is it has to be taken with a pinch of salt okay um i recommend doing it but it has to be taken with a pinch of salt sure um in terms of when to measure looks um you would measure looks when all of the lights are on so for example if you want to measure power density i usually turn everything that's not incandescent off um, because they can sway the power density meter slightly towards visible light uh, similar for UV, I'll keep the heat lamps on for UV because the UV lamp will get warm and it'll produce a different reading when it's warm. Um, but then for Lux, I have all the lights on and read the Lux. Okay. And each time, wait an hour between. So it's a, it could take a while to read an enclosure. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, so that, Thomas, that was a ton of information. And I, I think. I'm so uh, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 that's good. That's what we <laughs> want from this. And I think this will be a, a huge amount of, uh, a huge benefit for people that are just kind of, again, on the on the perimeters. And I think for anyone listening, if you made it this far just on audio, congratulations. But you should definitely go so back. <laughs> you should go to the YouTube video. This is one where I think just to help the understanding the, the visual side is, is just so important. And, and uh, maybe this will generate a bunch of questions from people and, and we can uh, uh, do another oh, one. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there is there anything else that you wanted to mention or say before we completely wrap up? Um, no, not necessarily. Just the frog saying thanks for watching. Yeah, there you go. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> he, he's disappeared. Um, I think he was the first thing I deleted as well. Oh, well. <laughs> um, yeah. Other than that, I'm um, I'm I'm pretty happy. I mean, people. I don't know if, if you want me to push. Me, people are happy to. People can contact me if they want my email address. I'll, I'll write it on the screen, but it's tom at tamascus.co.uk. Um, you, again, you don't need to. Um, that's yeah, what it is yeah. there. And I'll, I'll make yeah. sure that's in the show notes as well as the the link to your website, which I think has your contact information as well there. Yeah, you, I mean, you know, I, I don't... <laughs> You're welcome to message me on, on Facebook. You message, go on the Reptile Lighting Group. I'm always on there. Um, but you know, I'm I'm one of many many people. I'm I'm just a pawn in a, 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 a what's the word? I'm mortal among gods, right? There's these amazing people who are much smarter than I am, who've been doing it much longer than I am, uh, than I have, and they know much more than me. So take that, take everything I've said with a slight pinch of salt. Again, I I do this as a job, but there are caveats in everything I've said. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's nothing really other than other than I think people should do their best to learn more about yeah. what they can. Um, I don't expect anyone to remember anything that I've said, especially. Um, and I certainly don't expect everyone to be as interested as I am or some other people might be in lights. But I think it would help a lot more if people if more people paid attention to lighting. Absolutely. And I think in the end of the day, it is actually a fascinating part of reptile keeping and, and for me uh, i be, be the only downside of lighting is expense because it is expensive to properly light things and that's just there's just no way around that and we kind of have to live with that but there's mm -hmm. just so much it's just so interesting creating that you know fleck of sunlight like you showed in that frog slide and how, how do we create that and i think 
this podcast will go a long way along with the other ones I did with Rom and Dr. Baines, of course. And we've had, you know, there's a lot of podcasts on here now that have a good amount of lighting information. And, you know, people will probably have to listen to this more than once just to fully grasp everything. And that's totally fine. And like Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, or or like you said, going to reptile lighting is another great resource and uh, you can, you know, contact you from there as well. So until we do another one, Thomas, I do really appreciate this. This was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for coming on, and uh, I can't wait to see this this space continue to develop over time. Yeah, hopefully. All, all of these graphs and things that I showed, these are all pretty much all on the Reptile Lighting Forum as well. Perfect. So if you want more information about specific lights, just ask on there, and the chances are it's on there already somewhere. Uh, someone will have it because people save them to their phones all the time. So Awesome. Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for being here. All right, that is the end of that episode. Thomas, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast and just giving us so much information and putting together that incredible presentation. I did not ask Thomas to do that. I just asked him to come on the podcast and gave him a couple of the topics that I wanted to chat about. And he came prepared with this full presentation, which I think, as I said in the intro, it's pretty vital to have some visual elements when it comes to speaking about lighting. So if you did get through the entire audio side, that's incredible, but you should also come back to the YouTube side so you can get those visuals to really help those concepts click. I'm sure you're exhausted after this because that is a lot of information to have and you may have to go back and listen to this once or more than once. I know I will, but it is so vital that we slowly creep towards a better understanding of the solar spectrum. We don't even understand fully how the solar spectrum impacts the biology of the animals we keep there's a bunch of unknowns there so the closer we can get to replicating that the better because there's going to be benefits that we aren't even aware of yet and of course there's a giant list of benefits that we already know exist so the more you can do the better my own takeaway is i need to source uva a better source of uva so whether that's through somehow finding metal halides or there's a few of the led uv products that you know have quite a high uva rating so maybe that's the direction i think i would really like to find a metal halide light light if i can but anyway you'll have to let me know what your takeaway was hopefully you enjoyed it hopefully you found it valuable as i said at the end if you have a bunch of questions put them on youtube send me a message actually spotify lets you comment on on podcast now so you can comment there we want to start accumulating more questions so i can have these lighting experts on we can start asking them those questions and you can have them explaining the answers which i think is much easier than sometimes than trying to read it yourself and trying to figure it out so anyway if you do have questions if this podcast sparked more questions definitely put that in the comment section or in somewhere contact me send me an email it doesn't matter thank you very much for listening share this episode this is one of those ones that should be shared amongst the community it's so valuable if you're looking for more information on the podcast head to animalsathomenetwork.com thank you to custom reptile habitats for sponsoring this podcast if you're looking for information on them make sure you head to the affiliate lo- affiliate links in either the youtube description or the show notes if you do make a purchase there a small commission comes back to me at no extra cost to you thank you to every single one of my patrons or patrons i am incredibly grateful for everybody that has an account on patreon and i I do really appreciate that support so if you want to support the show there if you're enjoying it and you think it's worth a couple of dollars each episode head to animals or head to patreon.com slash animals at home for more info and i will see you guys in the next episode